fans, and welcome back to Pride Resurrection, the historical video series dedicated to the Pride Fighting Championships, where with each episode, we'll take a look back at a specific event from Pride's history. And today, dear viewers, we're gonna take a look back at Pride Fighting Championships number eight. I am the most dangerous man alive today, and joining me is the machine. So the Colombian good vibe, oh, that little rat bastard. He won't be here until the second half, so we're gonna trudge on without him for now. It's November 21st, 1999. 16 gladiators have prepared themselves for the most deadly of games. It's only fitting that a Coliseum shall play host to their punching action. So it's the Ariaki Coliseum in Tokyo, Japan that we'll see Pride 8 being held. 10,000 Japanese fans are in attendance and holy shit, this card is fucking stacked, at least for the time. We're gonna be treated to eight spectacular fights on this eve of MMA action with Boss Rutan and Steven Quadros providing their expert analysis. And this is it, this is the final episode of the first era of Pride, that is. After this episode, we'll be crossing the threshold into one of the greatest eras of MMA as Pride will quickly rise to become the biggest promotion in the world. This is also our very last true DVD viewing of Pride, and I must say, the video quality on this DVD is particularly shit and low resolution. It, it's another double-sided disc. Yep. Uh, so I think they struggled to fit all the fights on the disc itself. And you know, it's taken a big step backward. The last one we had the little graphics that were showing how, how long was remaining in the fight. Right. You know, uh, who the fighter was, they had the flag. Uh, even though some of those details weren't exactly correct. Uh, this one, it doesn't have all that. Uh, but what it does have is somebody, whoever one of the producers was, they made that awesomely shit <laughs> intro with the bad English words on there. Uh, some of the phrases are, give me the power and must be God. Must be God, what the fuck does yeah, that Yeah, I, I didn't get that either. And also, time to be wild. Uh, it's all amazingly cheesy shit. Plus they spliced in Instruments of Destruction, that old 80s rock song. They, yeah. they, they cut it together and I'm sure nobody paid to use it. Uh, so it's pretty cool. Uh, I'm making a new intro for Pride Resurrection using it. It's pretty funny. Uh, before we get into the fights here, what else was happening in the MMA world at this time? Just two days prior to Pride 8 here, UFC was in town for UFC 23 Ultimate Japan number 2, which took place at the Tokyo Bay NK Hall. Official attendance for this event was not listed, but just for a point of reference, the last UFC in Japan was seen in person by 5,000 fans, and the Tokyo Bay NK Hall tops out at around 7,000 fans. So you do the math, viewers. How many were at UFC Ultimate Japan number two? What went down at UFC Ultimate Japan number two, you ask? Why Daiju Takase was there. Remember this piece of shit from Pride number three? He would fight and lose, of course, via decision to Kenichi Yamamoto, pro wrestler and future Pride fighter. Yamamoto, by the way, would win the four-man middleweight tournament held that night. His prize, you ask? Nothing! Kevin Randleman, future Pride star, and who will also catch a glimpse of tonight in this event. He also fought that night, beating Pete Williams in a five-round decision. And to cap it all off, Tsuyoshi Kosaka, TK, future Pride fighter and future, um, I guess you could say, semi-famous UFC fighter. He also fought, losing to Pedro Hizo via TKO in the third round. And that's all I have for Pride number 23. Now, it's time for Pride. Let's get into the fights. <laughs>
Our first fight of the evening sees a returning Vanderlei Silva. Oh, hold on. Before we do this, I got to pop one of these open. All right. Now we can go. Our first fight of the evening sees a returning Vanderlei Silva, who stands 5'11", was 199 pounds, and was 23 years old at the time. Silva's MMA record as of this fight was 9 and 2. He's facing off against a returning Daijiro Matsui, who stands 5'9", was 199 pounds, and was 26 years old at the time. Matsui's MMA record, meanwhile, was 1-1-2. One, one, Quadros welcomes us in to pride number eight, and we again get the iconic wrist rolling of Silva straight away. Matsui definitely has a tough task ahead of him here, but Silva's last appearance was not that impressive, even though Quadros begs to differ. Round one, standoff in the center of the ring. Matsui leg kicks and Silva counters with a one-two. The men exchange a series of punches, but none really get the better of each other. Missing high kick by Silva. There's a big overhand right by Matsui, then he shoots in for a leg. Silva winds up stuck in the corner and pounds away at Matsui with punches. Quadros compares the legendary Shoot Box Academy, which Silva hails from, to the Dakota Dojo. Both men come from a proud heritage. Uh, Mandalay Silva from the Shoot Box Academy in Curitiba, Brazil. Uh, Takata Dojo is the training place of Daijiro Matsui. Both have legendary fighters. Uh, Shoot Box Academy has Jose Pele Landi and now Vandalay Silva. Whereas Takata Dojo has got the legendary pro wrestler Nobuhiko Takata, but more recently, the mixed martial arts sensation Kazushi Sakuraba, a training partner to Daijiro Matsui, who is now on the bottom working for the takedown. Oh, not much action here before Matsui decides to try and stand, trying for a double leg. Matsui tries some foot stomps, just like he did to Dirty Bob in Pride number seven. Matsui loses position and Silva winds up on Matsui's back. He pounds away at Matsui's head, working very methodically. Matsui manages to stand, lean outside the ropes, and Silva tries to punt his face, not once, but twice. Matsui merely steps outside of the ropes to evade any damage. The fight is restarted in the center of the ring and Matsui moves in to eat a head kick. Matsui moves in again, but Silva pushes him back with a barrage of punches. They hit the corner. Matsui goes low for a leg, but Silva stops him with knees, delivering five good shots with Matsui looking to escape, but Silva stays with him, punching his face. Matsui desperately falls forward for one of Silva's legs, but Silva sprawls. Great action here by Silva. Silva with a forward headlock position and Matsui's nose is bleeding, which Quadros comments on, saying the knees must have gotten through. Boss responds, oh, he just has high blood pressure. Uh, some of those knees did get through to Daijiro Matsui's face. Or he just has high blood pressure. Five minutes down in round number one. Light work by Silva and he eventually transitions to Matsui's back, delivering some more powerful shots. At the seven minute mark, Silva pulls away and boots Matsui right in the ass. And just after Quadros got done lamenting the fact that knees and kicks to the head of a downed opponent are not legal, Silva tries to stomp the head of Matsui. Yeah, he did. And I don't know what's going on with the rules of pride right now. I can't tell you fans for the life of me what's legal, what's not legal. If the opponent or if the fighter has to be facing upwards on the ground for kicks to the head to be legal, if they're facing down on all fours, if it's illegal, I wish I had some clarity, but not even Quadros knows what the fuck is going on. Matsui gets to his feet and Silva pushes forward, delivering nice straight punches as Matsui is trapped in the corner. Then Silva goes for more knees, as Matsui simply looks outclassed here with no ability to defend knees. Matsui dives for a foot and Silva sprawls. Silva has back side mount. Matsui appears to have a deep cut somewhere on his face as he begins to paint the canvas red with his blood. Yeah, it was dripping. Yeah, it was. It, at one point, I almost thought he was he was trying to write his name because it had almost like the script kind yeah. of brush strokes to it. <laughs> the ref halts the fight so that Matsui... Uh, I was going to say Matsui. 
The ref holds the fight so that Matsui's face can be checked. There's a very fine crescent cut next to his left eyebrow. The doc says it's okay and the fight restarts, but initially not in the last position. Fucking terrible refing, but the ref realizes his mistake and has Matsui go back to the mat. Good job, ref, good job. Matsui spins up to his feet, shoots out a kick, and Silva responds with a kick of his own. Matsui then fires away with punches, but Silva fires back, and we have an all-out brawl as Quadros chastises Matsui, saying there's no way he can trade with Vanderlei. It's gonna be over. But it's like you said, Matsui in the beginning he couldn't punch, and look at him now. And he knows he has to go. Matsui can't train here with Vanderlei. He's trying to. He's going, this is crazy. It's like a suicide mission. Left in round one, and Matsui has given up his punching endeavor, and he hits the mat. Silva winds up in full guard. Quadros and Boss both agree that Matsui is in over his head. Matsui seems to be in over his head in this fight. Yeah, I think so, too. Way over his head. I think he knows that there is a chance that the doctor is going to stop this fight with the cut, so he's going to give it everything he has. Vanderlei pounds away at Matsui, then gets pushed off. Silva then tries another flying stomp that is rebuked, then standing stomps by Silva, but his use of the ropes for leverage nets him a yellow card. The fight is stopped and restarted, and after it's restarted, a high kick rocks Matsui. He shoots in, and then the bell rings. Great round if you like watching a one-sided beating. What should do? Matsui's face is a fucking mess. Round two! Matsui paws with a leg kick, then punches. Silva feints a strike. Matsui gets scared and ducks low, to which Silva gets on top in a forward headlock position. Silva raises up, thinks about a strike, then Matsui rolls to his back. Matsui gets to his feet and Silva pounces on him, delivering straights and hooks. They are locked up in a corner with Silva in a dominant position. Matsui ducks through the ropes to avoid any more damage. The ref stops and then restarts them in the center of the ring, and Matsui's face is seeping once again. Silva with an uppercut, then clinch, followed by knees. Matsui goes for a judo toss, but he slips and falls to the mat. Silva now has his back. Matsui is leaving a puddle of blood under his face. Quadro says that Matsui is taking the beating of his life. Nobuhiko oh, Takata looking on as Daijiro Matsui is taking probably the beating of his life right now. Maybe a little bit of a stretch, but he's definitely getting his ass kicked. Silva gets his hooks in, turns Matsui over, and goes for a choke, but Matsui smartly spins, and now Matsui is in top in Silva's guard. Matsui delivers punches, but Silva stays busy himself from the bottom. Matsui bleeds onto Silva, covering him in his blood. It's kind of gross and doesn't look that very sanitary. Five minutes down in round number two. Both men keep a steady pace as Matsui tries to pass guard. Nice lefts by Silva from the bottom, which Matsui does his best to block with his face. Silva's tape on both of his gloves is all fucked up and coming apart. The ref comes in to stop and reset the fighters out of the ropes, but does nothing about the fucking gloves. There are three minutes left now in round two. Quadros quips about the gloves falling apart. Getting in, it looks very stylish before Boss has a chance to. These gloves are just falling apart. The gloves are completely falling apart here. He adds the tape around them. I think it's blue tape, looks like. Uh, it looks very stylish, though. Yeah, I just want to say the same See, thing. I beat you that time. Yeah, I you beat me. Finally, I got one. Yeah. I got one in. Oh, no. We had many times. <laughs> <laughs> now, Silva does palm strikes, popping Matsui, whose output has decreased. Silva just doesn't quit, giving Matsui about nine good shots to the right ear. We're down to one minute in round two, and both men are sweaty and covered in Matsui's blood. Despite Matsui being on top for quite a while now, he's still getting beaten here from the bottom by Silva. Hilariously, Quadros and Boss try to count Silva's punches. Two, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 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 Oh, he's still five, six, seven. It's like he's doing a drum solo on yeah. Matsui's head. Turn left, turn right, turn left, turn right. The bell then rings, ending 
round two, and we'll go to the judges for a decision. Vandalay Silva! Vandalay Silva getting a unanimous decision. And it's declared Vandalay Silva the winner via unanimous decision. After the fight, Silva throws some shirts, and Boss says he should throw that little cup, referring to the trophy that Silva got. And, well, he used his axe that time, and that axe happened to be that right knee. He should throw that cup. That would be fun, huh? What were your thoughts on this fight? I thought it was, uh, this was one that finally showed what Vandalay Silva could do, you know, some of his tie clinch and stuff like that. It also, like, you know, man, so he had heart to that. I didn't think he was going to be able to stay in there with a really determined Vandalay Silva. I agree. I think uh, the, Silva, you got to give Carl Malenko some credit. Although, you know, you could say he wouldn't turn out to be that great of an MMA fighter. He still neutralized Vandalay Silva. Oh, yeah, took, he, took everything, you know, took his whole offense. Yeah, took him, it took him to a three round, you know, two rounds in the overtime. Took him in a decision, and Vanderlei Silva didn't really damage him. Uh, Vanderlei Silva did kind of beat the shit out of Matsui here. It wasn't like, I mean, an absolute demolishing. I, I don't think Matsui was in any danger. He, I mean, he's he was hurt, but he wasn't like close to being knocked out. If this is the first time you really got to see somebody get torn open and like blood on yeah, the mat. Oh yeah, oh you yeah. Know what I mean, I mean, other people have been hurt, but I, this was like you know, when, yeah. With the next guy coming in to fight, is seeing the blood yeah, on the, the blood cameras. is everywhere. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah, I thought uh, you know what. Uh, Matsui had the best outcome he could have hoped for. Uh, it could have been a lot worse for him. Uh, good showing by both men, though. So, what would become of our two extreme fanatical warriors here? Vanderlei Silva would be returning for the next Pride event, which would be the opening rounds of the Pride 2000 Grand Prix, where he'll have a go at Dirty Bob Schreiber, who last fought Matsui in Pride 7. Should be a good fight. As for Matsui, he wouldn't be back until Pride 9, which would take place in June of 2000, the first event after the conclusion to the 2000 Grand Prix. There, he'll take on Igor Volchanchkin. Holy shit. See you then, Matsui. Our second fight of the evening features newcomer Frank Twinkletoe Trigg from the USA, who stands 5'8", was 169 pounds, and was 27 years old at the time. Trigg's MMA record as of this fight was 5-0. He's facing off against newcomer Fabiano Iha from Brazil, who stands 5'8", was 168 pounds, and was 29 years old at the time. Iha's MMA record as of this fight was 3-1. We have two new fighters to Pride, and so we have to answer the question, just who the fuck are these guys? Fabiano Iha was born in Florianopolis, Brazil. I think I got that right. Iha would train under Crolin Gracie, who was one of the many sons of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu co-founder Carlos Gracie. Iha made his MMA debut in 1998 at Neutral Grounds 5 in June of that year. This event took place somewhere in the United States, but I'm not exactly sure where. Iha's opponent for that fight was John Borsos, whom Iha would dispatch in only 25 seconds with an armbar. Later in 1998, in November, Iha would appear at Extreme Challenge 22 in Utah, a tournament where he would first defeat a young Eves Edwards with an armbar in the first round, then future Bellator combatant Kleber Luciano, whom Iha would defeat via KO after seven minutes in the first round. You watch a lot of Bellator. Have you ever seen Kleber? No. Hmm. Next stop for Iha was the UFC, where at UFC 20, held on May 7, 1999 in Alabama, USA, Iha would be stopped by Laverne Clark via TKO due to cut in the first round. Also in 1999, Fabiana would compete at the ADCC, that's the Abu Dhabi Combat Club, 1999 Submission Grappling Tournament. What about this Frank Trigg fellow? Born in Rochester, New York, Trigg partook in amateur wrestling in high school which he continued through junior college before landing at Oklahoma University and stepping into NCAA Division I wrestling, which he competed at from 1994 to 1997. After graduating college in 1997, Trigg made his MMA debut at Unified Shoot Wrestling Federation 7 in October of that year, which took place in Texas. 
Trigg would have to face down three opponents in a tournament battle that night, but he would succeed beating his first opponent via KO after 10 minutes in the first round, then securing two successive chokes against his next two opponents, both in the first round. Uh, his opponents weren't anybody to uh, make note of. Trigg then found himself headed to Japan, first to compete at Shuto, Las Grandes Vijas 3. <laughs> yes, the, a Japanese promotion has that right. for a fucking name. I kid you not. Let me say that again. Shuto Las Grandes Vijas 3 in Tokyo on May 13th of 1998. His opponent, Marcelo Aguilar, would succumb to punches by Trigg at three minutes in the second round. Then it was on to Valley Tudo, Japan, where he appeared at Valley Tudo, Japan 1998, held on October 25th of that year. His opponent, Brazilian John Jax Machado, would be stopped by his corner in the third round when they threw in the towel. And that brings us here to Pride 8. Quadros calls this the wrestler versus the jiu-jitsu man. And Iha has some Japanese shit shaven into the back of his hair. Any guesses on what it says? At first, before I took it close, I thought it was scars. <laughs> yeah. I did. When I first seen it, I'm like, it looked like his head was scarred. And I'm like, oh, yeah, it's got to be something stupid. Yeah, you can see the strokes of, like, yeah. it's, I have no idea. Any Japanese, this is a call to any Japanese fans. I know there's not a whole lot of you watching. Uh, but if you could translate to what the fuck Iha's head says, please Make a comment. We would greatly appreciate it. Round one. Trig goes straight for Iha. Pushes forward with a kick. And Iha just misses with a counter right hook. Trig tries a body kick. And then grabs a swinging Iha. They tie up in the corner. And Trig delivers some knees. Looking a lot like Silva in the previous fight. Some dirty boxing by Trig. And Iha tries to pull guard. Wrapping his legs around Trig's waist against the ropes. Trig gets tired of holding Iha up and goes to the mat, which is probably exactly what Iha wanted. Quadros must have heard my spiel on Iha as he repeats my retelling of Iha's appearance at Extreme Challenge 22. Fabiano did win a four-man mixed martial arts tournament on November 21st, 1998, and it was the Extreme Challenge 22. He beat Eves Edwards, and then he beat Clever Luciano in a shootout in the final round. Hey, get your own facts, Quadros. Light work by Trigg from the top, that is to say, slow. Iha picks away at Trigg's right ear with right punches. Iha tries to set up an arm bar, but Trigg defends. Then a left triangle begins to form for Iha. Trigg then stands up and gets out of it. He then goes back down to the mat. Trig teases pulling off Iha's trunks in what could have turned into sex, but the ref thankfully stops this from continuing. Did you? Hand smack it. Yeah, it's like he got both hands. Tied, like, what you... Yeah, like he was like gonna just gently coax him down, and we were gonna witness sex in the fucking ring. Thank you, ref. Thank you for stopping that. Iha sets up an armbar again, and he barely, nearly gets it. But Trig, with on-point timing turns his arm at just the right moment to save himself from any pain. He lifts and slams Iha and then stacks him. Iha then lets go and Trig is out of danger for now. Applause from the crowd over the action. Oh, he's going for that arm bar now. He's got the, got the, oh, he's got the arm bar, almost no, got, got it. Got Slam it. Ahead. He should hurt the head now and, or go for a triangle. He should go for full the hat. No, he's got some leverage. No. Go for try. Oh. Big laughs delivered by Trig, getting a rise from Quadros. I do love it when Quadros gets excited. Iha then regains control of Trig and locks him down. Boss checks his notes and comments on Trig. Knocking out John Jock Machado. Yeah, I see here that uh, Frank Trick TKO'd Jean Jacques Machado. My God, I mean, talking about somebody who's real good. While Boss finds this feat impressive, little did Boss know that that would be John Jock's only MMA fight, as he would realize he didn't very much like punching and would instead go strictly for submission <coughs> grappling from that point on. Trig stands up and pulls Iha by his feet before stepping away. Iha is able to stand as well. 
Trig and Eha meet, exchange, but Trig takes it up a notch, delivering a nice uppercut, then a slick left hook, which spins Eha around. Eha flails with his hands out as Trig sends bombs towards Eha's head. And then he sends a big knee, tries a kick, left punch, and the men exchange kicks, and then they lock up again. Trig, starting to slow down now, throws a good right hand, and then an awkward kick. Trig continues to push forward as Eha backs away. The men lock up and Eha secures half a clinch before chopping away with right hands, to which he abandons as Trig still pushes forward. The men lock up again and Trig knees Eha, pushing him towards the corner. Then a good right hand by Trig. Eha fires back, then a brief tie clinch by Trig. He lets it go and delivers a left and right as Eha tries to cover up. Eha manages to circle away, but Trig calmly walks him down. Eha with a leg kick. Trig goes forward, swinging away and missing. Eha tries to time a counter punch. Trig secures another clinch and delivers knees, then a right cross. Eha is dazed in the corner, and Trig seizes his moment, clobbering a near defenseless Eha with uppercuts and hooks. Eha, unable to take it anymore, buckles, collapsing down to the mat. The ref jumps in and waves the fight off, and thus Frank Trigg is the winner at five minutes exact in the first round. And wow, what a great fucking game. Mm. What shall I do next? But how much more can Fabiano Eha take? Hammer, please. Oh, oh no. another good right. Big, uh, uh, big left this, uppercut. This doesn't look good. Right uppercut. This doesn't look good. Goes it's down. Over. The fight is over. Oh. It's over. A dominating victory by Frank Trigg. He walked in there almost Boss Rutten style and just said, let's go, let's trade, and outgunned him. Showing from Trigg. What, what did you think of this one? That was like Frank's, like Frank Trigg's best one. I, I, he knew e -Hard didn't have nothing for him on the feet, so you know, and they're throwing kicks back and forth, they're like, kicking each other for a second, and then what's he caught with that one uppercut and spun around? I think he knew he just really didn't have nothing for him on the feet, so um, easy fight. I think, uh, I have, honestly, I haven't seen a whole lot of Frank Trigg fights because he went off and fought in, like, a different, you know, he different fought promotions. Matt Hughes a couple times. Yeah, uh, he fought Matt Hughes a couple times in UFC. He appeared a couple times in Strike Force, but mostly I know him from just his future commentating in Pride, which I'll get into right now. So, what would become of our two Extreme Max 169 fighters here? This would be Fabiano's only appearance in Pride. He would go on to fight in several UFC events after this, which would include bouts against Daiju Takase. Remember this piece of shit from Pride number three? That would happen at UFC 29 in December of 2000. A fight that Fabiano would, you guessed it, win in spectacular fashion. He would also face off against Cole Uno, high-pitched badass at UFC 32 in June of 2001, a fight that Iha would lose. Fabiano's final fight of his career would occur in March of 2005 at LIP number 1, that's Lockdown in Paradise, which took place in Hawaii. He would beat the shit out of his opponent, John Cox, KOing him at 30 seconds in the first round, thus ending his career with a record of nine and five. And what about Twinkle Toes? Odd thing here, we wouldn't see Trigg actually compete in Pride again until Pride 33, the second to last Pride event ever. Why did he leave? Not sure, but my guesses are money, travel time, and maybe the lack of championships in Pride at the time. After Pride 8, Trigg would be a finalist at the 2000 Olympic Trials, but he wouldn't compete at the actual Olympic Games. Frank would then join the World Fighting Alliance, fight at their WFA2 event in July of 2002, and then capture their welterweight title at WFA3 in November of 2002. That title would be one he would never defend. WFA wouldn't hold another event until 2006, and then shortly after, they went belly up. In 2003, Trigg joined the UFC and immediately fought for the UFC welterweight belt at UFC 45 in November of that year against 
Matt Hughes. He would lose that fight via rear naked choke. Which he was always susceptible to. Yes. He would try again for the UFC belt at UFC 52 in April 2005, once again against Matt Hughes. And once again, Hughes would beat him how? The old RNC. Rear naked choke, that's right. Trig would actually develop a nickname where they would or they would rename the whole Rear Naked Trig instead of Rear Naked Choke. Yeah, gonna get losing to Matt Hughes is nothing to like. Oh, no, no, no. I yeah. mean, one of the best yeah. welterweights to ever get in there. Yeah. Um, Hall of Fame. But Trig would never be able to capture the UFC welterweight belt. Trigg would actually return to Pride in a non-fighting capacity in 2006, providing color commentary after the departure of Boss Rutan. We'll eventually get to hear that way down the road. To learn more about the adventures of Twinkle Toes, though, you'll have to tune in to Pride Resurrection Episode 54, where we'll cover Pride 33 in about five years' time. See you then, Frank. Features a returning Alan Goes, who stands six foot, was 200 pounds, and was 28 years old at the time. Alan's MMA record at the time was 3 1 and 2. He's facing off against a returning Carl Malenko, who stands 5'11, was 198 pounds, and was 29 years old at the time. Malenko's MMA record as of this fight was 1 and 2. Alan is back after a short hiatus. We last saw him compete at Pride 4, where he took home a draw against Kazushi Sakuraba. Since then, he hasn't fought at all. Malenko's back after what I am calling an impressive stand against Vanderlei Silva at Pride 7. The mere fact that he wasn't killed is a victory in its own right. Round 1! A bouncy Malenko is easy pickings for Goes as he shoots in. He unbounces Malenko and gets him to the mat. Goes is in full guard. Malenko looking super calm here. He tries to push off and escape, but Goes stops him. Goes manages to slide into half guard, then hops over to side control. Quadros and Boss try and remember what happened in Malenko's fight against the bald Anoe brother before Quadros begins to shit on that fight. Already got side control. Yeah, that was, for what I can remember, Egan couldn't do that, huh? Was that? He could come to side control, or was the other way around? No, it was the other way around. Uh, come and go, uh, Egan Paul. got the guard constantly, constantly, constantly. He got a real good guard, actually, Egan. Egan had a great guard. And he controlled Carmelenko, but Carmelenko got the takedowns and landed more punches and got the decision, although it was close and wasn't a terribly exciting one. Malenko with little knowledge on what to do here, other than the occasional buck attempt. Allen sneaks in the mount, and it's not looking good for Malenko at this moment. Carlson Gracie calls for shots to the cabeza. There's the legend himself, Carlson Gracie. Slow work by goes from the mount, with small strikes to Malenko's head here and there. Shoulder strikes by goes, which causes Quadros to try and explain what strikes are legal in pride. Shoulder strike again. It is a legal strike. The only illegal strikes that we have here are the head butts or any strikes to the groin or back of the spine or back of the head. Everything else is legal. No elbows, no head butts. And everything else goes. Pardon the pun. And at the front of the spine. Is that okay? But I know for a fact that Quadros is purely bullshitting here and that he doesn't know what's legal and what's not. Although Goes is in the dominant position, he hasn't accomplished much yet. Five minutes are down in round one. Boss lets the cat out of the bag. He talks about how Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is a national thing to do in Brazil. He then says 
Here in America, they go fishing. Probably, maybe, maybe three. I mean, in Brazil, this is uh, this is like a national thing to do. With us uh, here in America, they go fishing. Here in America, here in America, America. He's supposed to be in Japan, boss, <laughs> not America. What the fuck? He blows it again later in the Coleman fight. I don't have it written down, but I, I remember what it was. Go sits on top of Malenko and tries to set up an armbar, but big whoopsie as Malenko slips away and now Malenko is on top. But will he be able to do anything? Goes rolls for an armbar, proving he is very dangerous from the bottom, although nothing comes of it. Malenko seems content to just hold on to Goes here, and Quadros thinks it's cause he's afraid to strike and get caught with an armbar. Three minutes left in round one. Malenko with a tight grip on both of Goes' legs. And suddenly Malenko is flipped up and over Goes, although he manages to stay in top position. Allen punches Malenko a few times, causing Malenko to pull away and stand fully. Now Goes stands too, and they square off in the center of the ring. Malenko winds up for a punch and Goes ducks down, going for Malenko's legs and securing yet another takedown. Goes is in side control, then works for Mount before getting it. The ring announcer signals only one minute left and then Goes sinks in a triangle choke and after a moment of hesitation, Malenko taps. Alan Goes is the winner at nine minutes and 16 seconds of the first round. Malenko screams erratically in pure frustration. I think he just, he just dropped. Oh, he tapped out. Susan. He tapped off in the side choke. Malenko is completely frustrated and angry with himself, yelling out loud. Goes really, really clean. Beautiful. What a guy. Uh oh. Malenko says, fuck. He's fucking pissed. He literally throws a tantrum in the ring over this loss. Quadro says, Malenko just needs to let it go, and he's right. It's okay, buddy. It's gonna be okay. What did you think of this fight? This one, they were talking about his, you know, his his jiu-jitsu when he was fighting against Sakuraba, who was a better fighter. But now when you're when you're not fighting, he's not fighting Sakuraba. He actually got to show off some of his skills and why he was considered a, a jiu-jitsu practitioner. Obviously, I kind of figured this outcome. Yes, I, I figured it was going to be a submission at some point. I I figured it would be by armbar, but or rear naked choke, but. Absolutely, I agree. Um, not to shit on Malenko here. He's he's a fine he's a fine uh, he's a fine wrestler. I guess he's got good control. He can get on top and stay on top. But I don't think at this point in time he has the weapons to fight against some of the higher level guys. His striking isn't all that great. Uh, he really only has control. He doesn't have any jujitsu. So you're kind of seeing the limitations of Malenko as a fighter. So, what would become of our two maximum whaling combatants here? Alan Goes wouldn't be back until Pride 9, which would take place in June of 2000. There, he'll face off against a returning Vernon Tiger White. As for Malenko, this would be the last time we would see the Dai Do pro wrestler in Pride. He wouldn't return and instead would finish out his MMA career in the Real Fighting Championships promotion, a Florida-based regional promotion. Malenko would have sporadic bouts up until 2008, facing off against rather unnotable fighters, winning five out of six fights. He would end his MMA career with a record of six wins and four losses. God bless you, Malenko. We'll see you some other time. sees a returning Mark the Hammer Coleman who stands 6'1", was 245 pounds and was 34 years old at the time. 
Coleman's MMA record as of this fight was six wins and four losses. We'll knock off one of those losses. Yes, yeah, um, yeah, you're right. Yeah, we could probably say six and three and one, uh, one uh, uh, dive. He's facing off against newcomer Ricardo Moraes from Brazil, who stands six eight, was listed at two hundred and seventy pounds, and was thirty two years old at the time. Moraes's MMA record at this time was eight one and one. Mark Coleman hasn't fought since Pride 5, a shameful loss to Nobuhiko Takada. And now he has a mammoth of a man facing him. I mean, it's hard to make like, Coleman look small, too. You know what I mean? That's, this guy did. Absolutely. Just who is this Brazilian behemoth? Born in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, Moraes, known as the Mutant, had been long training with the Gracie clan, specifically Henzo Gracie. In 1995, Moraes fought in and won an insane 32-man tournament held in Moscow, Russia. Thumbbag, what are you doing? I'm not just saying I saw Bob and his cousin. He's your cousin? Yeah, and he's from Russia, too. No way. What part of Russia? I don't fucking know. Do I look like his fucking biographer? Oh, what part of Russia are you from? Moscow. In the absolute fighting tournament. It was at IAFC number one in November of that year. This tournament also featured Igor Volchanskin, who only lost to the man that fought Maurice in the final bout that evening, Mikhail Ilukin. Just to reiterate how tough this was, Maurice fought five times that night. Five fucking times. Insane. That is crazy. And more, he stopped his first four opponents with strikes in under two minutes. It took Maurice ten minutes to submit Mikhail. That's a pretty impressive feat. Morais then went to rings in Japan, competing against rather unnotable Japanese fighters, garnering a couple of wins, a loss, and a draw in that time. And that brings us here to pride number eight. Holy fucking caveman! Morais' nickname should be the Neanderthal, not the mutant. He looks like he was found in a block of ice, and after they thawed him out, they said, yeah, he should be an MMA fighter. <laughs> he's a hairy, ugly-looking motherfucker. I can't believe this, and he's a mammoth man. And like you said, it's hard to make Coleman look small. Coleman's chest still look like wider, I think, you know what yeah. I mean? You see, but this guy was, it's just, usually you don't dwarf Mark Coleman. No, no. And Quadros, like myself, is very skeptical of Maurice's listed weight. And this fuck ton of a man is likely pushing 300 pounds. Mark Coleman desperately needs a win here. But he has a tall mountain to climb, indeed. Round one! The men face off in the center of the ring with Maurice hulking over Coleman. Maurice swings with very robotic left hook. Coleman is backed up by Maurice with a left jab, then a downward sissy strike, and then a ringing left hook. The men grapple next to the rope, and Coleman is then pushed into the corner as Maurice leans on him. Quadros completely fucks up Maurice's fight history. He says Maurice was in a 16-man tournament in 1996. Well, Ricardo Maurice, he won a 16-man no holds barred tournament the absolute fighting championships number one and that was way back uh february 1st 1996. nice try though quadros the ref comes in and separates the fighters coleman eventually shoots in gets a single and takes the big man down coleman lands in maurice's long guard but he postures up hopefully to deliver some of his patented grounded pound Coleman gets pushed off, but he fights to get back into guard and manages to pass into side control. But briefly, he and Moraes continue to fight over position as five minutes have passed in round one before Coleman fully gets side control. Coleman lays across Moraes' chest and smothers him, and surprisingly, Moraes manages to slip out and get behind Coleman. Coleman stands, and then they separate. Maurice throws some rights, but his striking leaves a lot to be desired. Coleman with an uncommitted punch, and Maurice sends in two more, and then Coleman shoots down for his legs. Maurice sprawls this time, and tries to hook in a guillotine choke. Coleman goes for a neck crank, also known as the can opener, but he then gives it up pretty quickly. Three minutes remain in round one. Coleman with a good left, and then he works the body. Morais tries to push Coleman away and deliver an upkick, but Coleman doesn't seem to pay any mind as he gets right back into Morais's guard. Trapped against the ropes, Coleman doesn't do much here. 
Then the bell rings, ending round one. Quadros calls it a rather dull round, and I agree. Okay, that was a, a relatively dull round. Coleman on top. Coleman doing most of the striking. Random shots of some Japanese dudes, and I believe the second guy is Cole Uno. Not too sure, though. Round two! Moraes kicks and Coleman shoots in immediately, taking Moraes down with authority. Coleman is in side control. Coleman has Moraes' neck wrapped up, but both Quadros and Boss say he has nothing here. Oh, look at this. Coleman squeezing awful tight. Yeah, but what does he have? He, he doesn't have really anything, but... Slow work by Coleman, as he is merely hanging on at the moment. As Coleman smothers Maurice, Maurice decides to try and pull out. Coleman stays with him, but he lost his side control position. Coleman is now in guard and goes for the neck crank again, but Maurice defends it well. Body and head punches by Coleman. Coleman manages to pass Maurice's guard, landing in side control once again, and he delivers some punches to Maurice's head. Coleman grinds his elbow and forearm into Maurice's face. At the five minute mark, Maurice tries to unbalance Coleman and Coleman very nearly gets mount, but then he falls down to half guard. Maurice gets trapped in the corner and Coleman really needs to start punching. He's back in full guard. Quadro says there's never been a fight that Coleman hasn't given 100%. I think there's never been a fight where Coleman did not give 100%. Other um, the Takata fight, anyone? Yeah. Unless you say he gave 100% to the dive, which, okay then, I agree. <laughs> Stop and restart to move our fighters out of the ropes. There's light work by Coleman. Meanwhile, Maurice isn't doing anything. Quadro shits on our fighters here, saying neither one is a very versatile fighter. I wouldn't exactly call either one of these guys a versatile fighter. A versatile, versatile, no. There's one minute left in round two and suddenly Coleman gets in the mount. Maurice tries to unbalance and roll Coleman, but great control by Coleman as he stays on top. He begins to smash Maurice's face, but it's simply too little too late. The bell rings, ending round two. We're headed to the judges now, and will there be an overtime round? Boss thinks no. Yeah, it's not going to go to an overtime. I think that uh, Coleman's going to win the fight. I think Coleman's going to win the fight. The fighters stand and wait for the decision, and then... And Mark the Hammer Coleman gets a real close... Mark Coleman is your winner via unanimous decision. We get to see Brandon Lee Hinkle and hey, Kevin Randleman join Mark Coleman to celebrate. And apparently Coleman's dad is there too, as quoted by Boss. Good stuff. And there's Tim Catalfo, Kevin Randleman, Brandon Lee Hinkle. And his father, this was Coleman's father. Oh, the, 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 cap, the fourth guy, right. What was your thoughts on this fight? Uh, I think Coleman needed to do exactly exact what it did to win the fight. I don't think I don't think it would have been good to like stand with this barbarian. <laughs> yes, it, I agree. You know, after, especially after you know like that tournament that he won. You know, what I mean, just brass and it, 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 Coleman just went to his bread and butter basically. He right. Do what he needed to do to win. Not nothing super impressive, but. I agree. Got the job done. I agree. It wasn't flashy. Um, and if he did his research on Morais, he would have seen that he demolished uh, a 32 man tournament in one night. And uh, to see that and say, what do I got to do to stop this guy? Well, I got to take him down and hold him down. So, yeah, you could kind of say that Coleman laid and prayed on him and well, didn't. Played it safe, but it was, you yeah. Know. You know what? When you're coming off where uh, you think of where Mark Coleman's mind was during this fight. You know, he comes over to Pride, he's kind of, he's not had the best go of MMA recently, he's lost to a bunch of fighters. He comes over to Pride, they they offer him the, uh, the Dakota dive uh, with the promise of more fights if he does it. Right. So he does it and he knows that, hey, I gotta, I gotta start mounting some wins here, get some momentum going. So, you know what, kind of a boring fight, but I can't fault uh, Coleman. 
Uh, Morais wasn't an easy opponent. For him to be able to hold a fucking 300-pound 6'8 guy down and control him, that's pretty fucking impressive. So, what would become of our two extreme beefy fighters here? Mark Coleman would be returning in short order to take part in the 2000 Grand Prix. Appearing in the opening rounds will he'll take on Masaki Satake, a karate fighter and kickboxer. As for the mutant, he wouldn't return to Pride until Bushido 6 in April of 2005. Until then, he would only fight twice, both times in 2003, which included a bout against Shuyoshi Kosaka at NJPW Ultimate Crush in October of that year. Just a note here, fight fans, we're not going to be covering the Bushido events. So the next time we'll actually get to see Morais in a Pride event will be the last fight of his career at Pride. Final Conflict Absolute, which was held in September of 2006. We'll see you then, mutant. And that takes us to the halfway point of our exciting event, and we're about to enter the second half. And hopefully the good vibe will be joining us. But before that, it's time we take a break. So won't you join us as we go play some video games for your amusement and ours. And also to decide who will be the Pride Resurrection Supreme Masculine Hybrid Champion. Welcome to Intermission. All right, and look who's here. Hey, hey, it's not my fault my dog likes to shit all over the place when he has explosive diarrhea. I've been fucking cleaning that floor for like three days straight, dude. Like, fucking, by the way, listeners, if you have the money, spend it on a steam cleaner. Those things save lives, yes, man. Yes, they pay for themselves. Oh, my God. <laughs> Fuck life. Uh, so we're so glad he's here. We, we couldn't... Really do this without him, so we'll maybe recap. Well, apparently you could, because you did the fucking first half, asshole. Well, we had to, <laughs> no choice. All right, but we're playing Killer Instinct here, and uh, it's only right since I'm the champion, you guys have to play first to figure oh, out who Jesus. plays right. me. <clears throat> okay, I'll tell you who is it gonna be. <laughs> The answer is me. <laughs> uh, so your credits are the L button, and then the start button will get you going. Where's the fucking L button? Oh. Oh, start button. Is that not doing anything? Nope. Oh, there you go. Press it harder. Oh. Press the L button harder. Yeah. Okay, press the start button. Okay. There we go. I'm two up. All right. Yeah. Second, also known as second player. Yeah. <laughs> Have you ever played Killer Instinct? Oh, dude, I feel like I'm back in high school, except not even then would I play this because I'd be at oh. home fucking masturbating to fucking <laughs> dial up porn. You better pick a Saber Wolf versus Saber Wolf. Oh shit, did he pick Saber Wolf too? Alright, I did. All right, I, when this first came out, at first I was kind of against it. I wasn't a big fan of it, but it kind of grew on me because uh, me and Luke used to play this, a, uh, me and Machine used to play this a whole lot in the arcade. I can't, I don't know who the fuck is who. You must be the orange I'm one. I'm in the blue. Oh shit! Hey. Are you pressing the coin button? I'm off the by accident. <laughs> it was a good fight. Oh, I think he's just, he's, uh... He's just low attack. Yeah. <laughs> He's button mashing you out here. Uh, yeah. All right. Woo! It's best, best two out of three, so you got one more. I'm not uh, used to... Speed quality. No, I'm, I'm not used to... Uh, oh, how do you do this? There. All right. Press start. No, no. He, it's, That'd be you. I'm not used to using... If it was we were using like an Xbox controller, I'd be doing oh, much yeah. better. Oh, this yeah. guy looks cool. Fulgore. That's my guy. That's who I'm going to be playing. DJ Combo. <laughs> he loves America. Show enough. <laughs> this guy doesn't have to reach up the alligator. Oh, he would have strung that. Holy I, shit. I think he's going to demolish you now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He might. 
<laughs> you're just randomly picking. You know, he did the rabbit punches on you. you know, what? Oh, I think he did that on complete accident. <laughs> He's like, I think you pissed him off with that whole saber wolf shit. You got a tough, tough task ahead of you here. Oh, uh, awesome. Couldn't do it. Uh. Oh, yeah. Press the start button. And... Uh. All right. Did not like the range of that fucker. Ooh, he has a sword. Unfortunately, he doesn't use it a whole lot. <laughs> oh, what? What kind of bullshit is this? And he's Riptor. His reach isn't too bad, I feel like, his, his kicks. See this game, uh, you can be good at this game, you gotta know how to start the combos and you gotta know the combination. It's kind of like a puzzle game. Tears. Uh, so, I mean, once you get a combo going, you, you have to know the combinations after that to keep the combo going. Yeah, which for me, who's never played this game, doesn't fucking work out. Alright, now it's me versus Luke for the championship. I did not mean to do that. <laughs> he had to. Hey, you gotta do what you gotta do to win. Like we said, uh, Mark Kerr, or Mark Holman versus uh, Ricardo Morais, he did what he had to do to win. That's right. It wasn't beautiful, but... If I can get Fulgar's combos going, like I said, I used to be pretty good with Fulgar, but I don't remember how to do his combos. This game was really interesting because they actually used a hard drive that had just like the background there. It looks like it's in 3D. It's not. It's just a bunch of images and it like plays as an animation. Like little icy dip thing. Uh, oh, yeah, where he goes through the ground. Yeah, you have to know that, otherwise, you can't get no candles. This game is actually really deep. Um, but I think people didn't like it because you would play against people at the arcade, and people that knew what they were doing, they would. Oh, double hunk out. They would whip your ass in like two seconds. Yeah, like, my, brother, my brother knew a 40 hit combo if it worked. It was ridiculous. Oh, yeah, those ultra combos. Ultra combo! I don't think we'll be hearing the announcer say that tonight. <laughs> so I can't remember how to get his I can get his combo going, but I oh. oh, that's one of them. Oh, his combo starter? Yeah. Too late now. <laughs> oh far too late now. gonna be it. That's a win. Oh, let's see when you have. They also have different colors for the guys here. I can cycle through and fucking Mortal Kombat ripoff. Oh jizz, what is that? Is jizz? <laughs> is it flame jizz? That is flame jizz. <laughs> Why doesn't you just burn the bridge this? and kill you kill you? Yeah, you would think it would just, <laughs> just burn right through the floor. Uh, well, I guess he would go to his home as lava. Yeah, exactly. He would survive. You wouldn't. Oh. <laughs> you just got... Oh. oh, I hit him with the I-beam, but I didn't link it right. <laughs> he says, Inferno! Oh, there we go. That's it. Awesome combo. If I could link in the eye, the eye buzz, I'd get a monster. That's the most I could do. One time. One time. I, <laughs> only one time I did an ultra combo with Fulgar. And I don't know what the fuck I did or how I did it. Oh shit, that was a fucking mistake. Oh! Alright. 
Yeah, see, I can, I can do the awesome combo now probably without no problem, but... Oh, yeah, there we go. Every game <laughs> winner and still champion until see, next See, what we got to do is one of these times we got to play, like, fucking Mario Kart, not a fucking fighting game. We got to play fighting games. What do we do? We watch fights. God damn. <laughs> Let's get... Try some Mortal Kombat next time. Mortal Kombat arcade. We'll see how... Oh, we'll, we'll, we'll do I'll, that. I can oh. play that on the arcade stick. Oh, we'll do that. We'll yeah. do that. I mean, now it's time we get back to... We're going to lose regardless of what we fucking play. <laughs> the second half. Let's go. And our second half's about to begin. Oh, and we're back. That was a whole lot of fun. Of course, I'm the winner. I demand a recount. To okay. quote Trump, that was rigged. It was rigged. <laughs> Almost all these games are rigged. I'm just naturally good at video games. I, can't, I don't know. No, what you're naturally good at fighting video games. Let's <laughs> fucking call the difference. You there. just, it, they're all the same just hey, about. Exactly. And I don't fucking play them. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go home, buy Mortal Kombat, and fucking lay, learn all the combat. Hey, yeah, if I, uh, if you had, a, like, you weren't playing on a computer or something like that, and have all the new systems. Yeah, like I got. Controls. Before we go any further, uh, since Good Vibe wasn't here for the first half, do you have have anything you want to say about what happened in those exciting fights? Uh, I don't, honestly. I, I do want to say a couple things about the DVD itself. Oh, yeah. Like, so I talked about this. It took a big step backwards, for one thing. Really? Because for me, I mean, I, I, at least some of the graphics, yes, but the music... <laughs> the oh, yeah. music was so much better. Yes. The intro fights, the music were Act actually longer. Fit. Yeah. It, uh, to me, it did. You know, it, it hyped you up for the fights. It, it's a fucking long way from what? Pride 2 when we got that fucking, like, Japanese folklore music yeah. playing. It's yeah. like, Jesus Christ. Where, where the fuck am I for that? I Like I said, I don't know where they got this music from. If they got it, like, just some... Um, what is that called? Uh, where you don't have the copyright or like uh, royalty free music or like some public CD. domain? Yeah, public domain CD in Japan. Yeah. They just had all this fucking music, and somebody went through and said, "Okay, that, use that one, that one, and that one." You yeah. know, some of them fit, some of them don't. Some of them are pretty cool. Like when we get to the Gary Goodrich one. It's which is our next fight of the evening. That's the, what a transition! You're welcome. <laughs> our fifth fight of the evening sees a returning Gary Big Daddy Goodrich, who stands 6'3, was 240 pounds, and was 33 years old at the time. Goodrich's MMA record as of this fight was 9 and 8. He's facing off against newcomer Tom Erickson from the USA, who stands 6'3 was 280 pounds and was 35 years old at the time. Erickson's MMA record at this time was 6-0-1. Big Daddy hasn't competed since Pride 6, and he has a very tough task ahead of him in the hulking American wrestler. But just who is Tom Erickson? Is he a lumberjack? He might be. <laughs> He's a fucking big guy and the size of the head on him. Holy I know, man. I'm like, fuck, man. Born in Chicago Heights, Illinois, Tom wrestled throughout school, which culminated in a stint as a NCAA Division I wrestler, where in 1986 and 1987, he was named an All-American, which, for those that don't know, is a pretty high honor. And if you're wondering what the hell is an All-American anyway, basically every year a group of sports scholars get together and pick a hypothetical team of the best athletes in college. So it's kind of an honorary thing. It doesn't mean much, uh, but it's good for the resume, I guess. Tom made the jump in the MMA in 1997, showing up at the Martial Arts Reality Super Fighting, or MARS, promotion. On November 22nd, a tournament was held in Birmingham, Alabama, where Tom would have to wade through three opponents in one night. Tom dispatched his first opponent, a Russian dude with a very hard to pronounce name, via KO after eight minutes in the first round. Then Willie Peters came, who fell to a neck crank at 31 seconds in the first round. And then finally, it was Murillo Bustamante, future pride fighter. And after an exhausting fight lasting 40 minutes, a draw was declared. Thanks to Jeff Mazaros for the especially shit video I have of this event. <laughs> After that, Tom went on a winning streak, demolishing his next four opponents via KO or TKO, all in the first round in never longer than three minutes. This included Kev Kevin Randleman at Brazil Open of 97, held in June of 97. And that brings us here 
to pride number eight. It's been about a over a year since Tom Erickson last fought, uh, fought and he is definitely going to give Gary Goodridge a tough task here. And uh, again, just a note on Gary Goodridge's devil fucking music. <laughs> I don't know who decided that music fits Gary Goodridge. I guess maybe if you look at Goodridge's antics and you see how he acts, and of course this was all after the fact. Yeah, yeah, but I don't think I don't think I don't think they were thinking that it fits Gary. It's just it's just hype music. That's really all yeah. it is. It's trying to get you into into the fight. Um. Yeah, maybe. Sometimes it's it works. Sometimes it doesn't. Quadros calls this a fight of big and bigger. And Tom Erickson does look pretty damn good and in shape for 280 pounds. Yeah. He might be a little bit fat around the waist, but his abs are still visible. And if he shed about 30 pounds of fat, he would be fucking ripped. But I mean, he Girl, still looks toned, though. No, yeah, exactly. He's super toned. Yeah. Round one. Erickson charges forward, awkwardly throwing a kick at the same time as Goodridge. And then Erickson grabs a hold of him. Goodridge shoves Erickson away, and Erickson wades in with a weak kick, then swinging with rights as Goodridge is pushed into the corner. Both men try and grab the back of the other's neck. Goodridge pops Erickson with an uppercut, but... Erickson returns the favor with his own uppercuts, and then he pushes forward with body and head punches before a knee. And as Goodridge tries to mount some return offense of his own, Erickson has a hold of him, and Goodridge falls to the mat. Eric's I mean, it's kind of weird just that early on to see Gary Goodridge get overwhelmed with oh, strikes. Oh, yeah. Like, that, that's how you know that how, how fucking beastly Erickson is. Because, you know... Sure. Gary just couldn't couldn't form any sort of comeback when he was getting pelted. There. No, yeah, Erickson has completely overwhelmed him uh, early on in the fight here. Erickson is in side control, and while that was a great sequence, uh, definitely going to play it in full. Here. At knocking out Tom Erickson, boss? Yes, he does, for sure. He throws a bump. If, if, if Tom Erickson is not going to take him down right away. Gary's here to fight again. Both of them. Oh, see, this is so much different. Than the Coleman Rice fight. Erickson coming out with that right over, wow. under, over, under, over, under, again and again. What a shoot out here. Wow. Wow. Here. Quadros immediately uses this fight to shit on the Coleman um, and Marais fight, saying this was more action than the entire Coleman fight <laughs> in entirety. <laughs> That was more action in the first 30 seconds of this fight than we yep. saw in the entire Coleman. <laughs> he jinxed it. Yeah. Spoiler. <laughs> Erickson jumps to mount and Goodridge is in trouble here. Erickson postures up and goes to deliver some strikes, but Goodridge covers and rolls, giving up his side and back. Erickson is trying to club him, but Goodridge is mostly blocking him. Erickson takes a deep breath and he has to be cautious of gassing himself out. Erickson goes to work the body and Goodridge spins and manages to get Erickson into his guard. Nice move there. Erickson works a cross face before trying to smash Goodridge, and instead he straight up smashes the mat instead. Goodridge has locked Erickson down, and now he looks to roll or sweep Erickson here, before working punches himself along with palm strikes. Erickson is slowed down now, and I think he burnt his gas tank. Goodridge, unhappy with Erickson's slow work, puts his arms out and says, Come on, hit me! Hit me, baby! Um, Come on, hit he me! He should. Hit me, baby! I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say this. That's a, that's, that's a douchebag move from Gary. Because here's the deal. Sure, he hasn't landed the best hits, but Gary hasn't done shit. He's been on the defense of the entire goddamn time. So don't, don't fucking start bo boasting, hit me, hit me, when he has indeed been fucking hitting you. Right. Like, for, to me, what Erickson should have done is just don't try for the guard. Just let Gary stand up again because he was getting dominated. That would have been smart. Absolutely. And it continues. Goodrich then says, how about a kiss? And puckers his lips. Saying, please hit me. Come on. Come on, Gary. 
How about a kiss? Oh, about a kiss. Fucking oh hell. God. Goodridge delivers a right, then pushes away a lethargic Erickson, and Goodridge looks to move. He ends up losing a battle here, as Erickson gets half guard, and he clubs Goodridge a few times. Boss answers Quadro's question on why Goodridge was taunting Erickson, and Boss says... Maybe it's a psychological warfare. Uh, I mean, why would he want to make Tom Erickson hit him more? Yeah, I, um, I, I can't see it, but maybe it's a psychological warfare right there. You think he's going to try and get Tom Erickson rattled, Tom Erickson out of his game, thus Tom Erickson will get tired? Quadros is very dubious of that. I don't think it's just Gary being a douche. <laughs> it could be that too. Goodridge isn't letting it go, imploring Tom some more to that he can hit him harder than that. Oh, can you not hit harder than that? That's not a nice thing to say. Goodridge pushes Erickson away, who decides to stand up, but falls back into Goodridge's guard when Goodridge briefly teases a knee bar. Quadros gives Goodridge some love, saying he's one of the best pre-fight interviews in the business. One thing I've always liked about Gary Goodridge. Gary Goodridge knows about the show aspect of mixed martial arts. He's one of the best interviews, one of the best pre-fight interviews. He will talk some trash sometimes. Erickson tries to wail away with soft punches, to which Goodridge sarcastically says, ow, 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 then screams like a girl. Whenever you're ready, Daddy, whenever you're ready, whenever you're ready. Ow, 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 ow. This is these. Ow. It looks like Gary is having the time of his life here. Oh. It's absolutely, I was on the floor laughing. It was so fucking funny. Five minutes left in round one. Quadros asks Boss if he's ever seen Goodridge in the ring with anyone bigger than him. But really, have you ever seen Gary Goodridge in the ring with someone bigger than him? Never. Boss replies, clearly forgetting that Ogawa, Goodridge's last fight in Pride, was technically bigger than Goodridge. Maybe not muscle and weight wise, but he was a good bit taller than Goodridge. Goodridge playfully pats Erickson on the back, teasing arm triangle choke by Goodridge. Quadros and Boss talk about how no one wanted to fight Erickson. Well, one thing that no one could ever say about Gary Big Daddy Goodridge is that he ducked a tough fight. Here he is in with a man that every fighter in the heavyweight division has avoided. At the three minute mark, Erickson tries to pass guard, briefly getting side control, then falling to half guard. Erickson, while landing clubbing strikes on a Goodridge's head, isn't doing a ton of damage and he's slowed down considerably. This is the first I'm noticing, but Erickson has damaged Goodridge enough to make him bleed from the nose and mouth. Yeah, that was, that, I'm pretty sure that was when he pucked his lips. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think I think I, that's when I saw him start to bleed a little. Yeah, because he got he got smashed really hard right after yeah, that. Erickson smashed him a couple good times uh, on the ground there. Trouble again as Erickson secures mount, but he's immediately not doing anything with it. Slick Americana attempt by Erickson, but Goodridge escapes and Erickson sits up and slugs downward onto Goodridge's side and forearms. One minute left in round one. Erickson works the Americana again, then some good lefts. Goodridge tries to move, but has nowhere to go. Erickson lightly taps Goodridge with baby punches, and then the bell rings. Ten minutes down, end of round one. Goodridge immediately pops up, obviously wasting no energy in that round. He walks around and looks super fresh. Erickson takes deep breaths while sitting on a stool. And just a note for me here, Erickson definitely looks like a fucking Midwestern hick. I think I know about five guys that have his same stupid looking face. But see, for me, I, I'm going to completely disagree with you because I have a note here. At the moment round two started, here's what I have and I will read it out loud. Holy shit, I'm pretty sure Erickson is a muscle-bound version of David Hasselhoff. <laughs> That's what I have. For a second, there was a glimpse. I'm like, is that the Hoff? <laughs> that sounds like a reference Boss Fruit would make. <laughs> one second, before we get to round two. Yeah. Once again, I will say, Gary just, you know, prancing around, whatever. Fucking stupid. Because he, the reason he has energy is because he was kept down the entire first round. Right, right. So don't don't boast the fact that you have energy when you haven't done <laughs> when shit. You didn't do anything the whole round. Exactly, yes. exactly. Except taunt the guy. <laughs> it just keeps keeps bringing me back to the Manny fight. It's you know it's that that's the whole thing. I, I don't I don't like it. Piece of shit, digestive <laughs> 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 Oh 
Uh, round two! Gary starts us off with a leg kick. Erickson regains his footing and plows forward with swinging punches, pushing a flailing Goodridge to the ropes and nearly over the top as Goodridge bounces back violently. Then Goodridge falls back to the mat. Erickson is back in full guard. Soft slaps by Goodridge and Quadros wonders why. To these gentlemen on the ground, if they get busy and start slapping or punching, Gary's just slapping. Why he would do this, he would seem like he would want to lock him up and wait for a restart. Steady work by Erickson, but he's not doing a whole lot of damage once again. Erickson decides to try a new guard position, the deep throat guard, as he hooks Goodridge's legs and puts his head right down at the end of Goodridge's dick. <laughs> Goodridge, <laughs> Goodridge, obviously offended by this move, slugs Erickson a few times with hard rights, but he loses his steam and then simply lays back down. Now Goodridge is breathing hard as well. There's not a lot happening here. That's Quadros' words, folks, not mine. The occasional flurry by Erickson with soft punches by Goodridge. So much for, be for there being a lot of action in this fight, huh? That's huh? Right. huh? Eventually the ref comes in and... Repositions our fighters. Wrong, ref. Wrong. Yeah. Stand them the fuck up. I mean, exactly. Like, they're not doing anything worthwhile down on the ground. No. No. This fight was great when they're on the on their, uh, on their feet. Exactly. Yeah, which which lasted, what, maybe fucking 10 seconds of each round? <laughs> fucking annoying. The ref should have realized, look, when they were on their feet slugging away, or every time they've been on their feet, there's been action. Like the beginning of round one, yeah. the beginning of round two here where uh, yeah, exactly. Erickson nearly pushes Goodridge over the ropes. Uh, he should have looked down and said, uh, yeah, I think it might be better to stand these fucking guys. But then at the same time, he's probably, he's probably to a certain degree, helping Gary. Because we know Erickson's going to pelt the fuck out of him if they, uh, they, if they get up. Possibly. I mean, let's let's just be honest. The two times they've been, up, they've been standing, Gary has not been dominant. Right, right. So uh, I don't think I don't think a third time of them standing would show any anything else. Quadros was right though when he said that nobody would fight Erickson. Erickson was a scary dude. You know? Well, no fucking shit, giant fucking dude, <laughs> man. Three minutes left in round two, and simply more of the same in this position. Erickson, you could argue, is doing enough here to stop a stand up from happening. He's definitely doing enough to win the fight. Quadros wonders if Erickson will be asked back to fight in pride, considering the turn of his performance here. Okay, if Erickson wins the fight, Last two minutes. what does that prove? And then what does that mean? And does it mean that people are gonna to wanna to see him fight again? Does it mean that other fighters are gonna say, okay, great, I wanna fight Erickson? No, uh, no, nobody wants to fight Erickson. Because uh, it's like this, you, you cannot really fight. He can, he's real good at control. He also wonders if guys will want to fight him now. And Boss says no, because this is what Erickson will do to anybody he Bullshit. faces. You know what? You know what? This fight, you know who should fucking fight him? Igor. Igor, oh yeah. Just, just, be... just pick a fucking striker, man. <clears throat> Just someone that's really good at that. And, and that's the thing about MMA. You look at these guys that are really good at one area, and you say, oh, I hate them uh, because they fight boring, they do the same shit every time. But, you know, it's it's a legitimate tactic if you're a really good but see, wrestler. I, I will say this. I will say this. Me particularly, I don't like when, like, a fight's like this. When they go down to the ground, and it's nothing but... You know, half hour of them trying to Land get through top. each other fucking guard. Yeah. Last one minute of round two, and Quadro says that Erickson is a sportsman and Goodridge is a showman. Whatever the fuck that means. I think it's a, uh, a situation where Erickson is coming in only as a sportsman. Whereas a guy like Gary Goodrich is a showman. He then shits on Erickson, saying that people want to know more about Goodrich, while Erickson is just a mellow guy, a family guy, in other words, a boring guy. Whether Gary Goodrich wins or loses, people want to know about him, they want to hear his interviews, they want to see him get in and carry on and taunt the other fighter. Whereas Erickson is probably a pretty mellow guy, family man. And he may win the fight in this manner, but there's nothing outrageous about him. That's a boring guy that fucking wins fights. 
Erickson? Plain fucking simple, yeah. I mean, I don't fucking care if the guy goes home, sleeps with hookers, and does cocaine. I'm only watching him in the fucking ring. I don't care what his family life is like. Right, and I think Quadros is alluding here to the fact that Goodridge can sell a fight and sell, you know, tickets. Erickson, maybe not so much. The bell rings! Ending round two, and Quadros calls it end of this marathon of laying. Jesus, he's really being rough. He's telling you, he suddenly got super rough on this fight. Goodrich pops right back up again, walks around the ring. Unfortunately, I don't think that there's any reason for him to do so, as a unanimous decision has to be coming for Erickson. The fighters come to the center of the ring, and what do you know? Erickson is declared the winner via unanimous decision. That that was fucking uh, no no doubt about that. Absolutely, no yeah. There Jesus was no Christ. doubt. Yeah. Goodridge though looks quite perturbed, and he half heartedly. Hugs Erickson. Erickson collects his trophy, paying little attention to the cute ring girl, and he celebrates. Quadros guesses that Erickson's next fight would have to be against Morais. And who's next? Who's next for Tom Erickson? That's that's going to be my big question here at the Pride. It, it would have to be Ricardo Morais. Yeah, I think so too. That because would be. Uh... That's two big giant guys. What? Why? Morais just lost, Quadros. A winner of a fight does not go on to fight a loser of a fight. <laughs> the um, actual fight that you should have said should be coming would be Coleman. That would be the next logical opponent for Erickson or even an Igor Volchanskin. Anyway, what were you guys' thoughts on this fight? For me, it looked like the first couple of minutes of it looked like Erickson watched some tape of like when... Uh, Fry, or Don Fry fought Gary Goodrich with the overhands and the uppercuts. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. So that looks, you know. Yeah, yeah that, you're right. It was almost 100% just like it. I was actually surprised because I'm a Goodrich fan, so I thought, I thought, you know, I was going Gary all the way, but it, it was Erickson's fight. Yeah, I thought um, maybe Erickson was possibly afraid of striking on the feet. I don't know why he would be because he was demolishing Goodrich. So why would he want to just lay on top of him? Why wouldn't he want to... Yeah, I think maybe he was gassed and he didn't want to take the chance to get knocked the fuck out. That's possible too. Maybe he didn't have a gas tank to stay standing up. Maybe, but at the same time, I don't think Gary had the gas tank to stay up getting pelted like that. No, no. So it, it would have been both gases out. And, and I'm with you, Machine. Like, I'm a Gary guy. I love that son same of a bitch. Here, I, think I love that son of a bitch. But fucking... 15 seconds into that fight, I'm like, what the fuck is Gary doing? Right. Like, I think I think he went in too confident against someone that maybe didn't have a, a big record or anything, but he was getting pelted when standing up, and he wasn't doing jack shit when laying down. He didn't take him seriously enough. Right. right. So, what would become of our two massive masses of meats here? Gary Goodridge would return for the opening rounds of the 2000 Grand Prix, where he will face off against former sumo wrestler turned pro wrestler Osamu Kawahara, a 6'5", near 300 pounds mass of meat himself. Jesus, that's going to be interesting. Yes. As for Erickson, it would nearly be another year before he would fight again, which would occur at Pride 11, Battle of the Rising Sun, where a young Heath Herring awaits him. Herring, who will actually debut at Pride in Pride 9, was only 21 years old at the time, and he would already be a well-seasoned, MMA fighter coming into the Erickson fight with a pro record of 14 and 5. Definitely looking forward to that one. See you then, boys!
Our sixth fight of the evening sees a returning Alexander Atsuka. I was going to say Atsuka. It's so hard for me not to say that. It's Atsuka, who stands 6'1", was 203 pounds, and was 28 years old at the time. So, so by the way, is this a fight, or are we fucking going disco dancing? <laughs> yes. <laughs> like, holy fuck, those shorts, man. Yes. Like, I don't want to be gay, but I can't stop staring at his fucking <laughs> junk and or ass because <laughs> yeah. of those goddamn shorts. Well, actually, I have a note on this in just a sec. Atsuka's MMA record as of this fight was 1-2. and two. He's facing off against a returning Henzo Gracie, who stands 5'10", was 185 pounds, and was 32 years old at the time. Henzo's MMA record as of this fight was 6-0-1 with one no contest. Neither man has fought an MMA bout since their last go-round in Pride, which for Henzo was all the way back in Pride 2, where, if you remember, Henzo tortured us with a 50-minute-plus slog against certified lump of shit Sine Kakuda. <laughs> That was just He's not certified, huh? <laughs> Sine Kakuda is a certified lump of shit. And yes, that fight was fucking awful. Yes. I don't know if I ever mentioned this, but I tweeted at Henzo about whether why why he didn't finish uh, Sine Kakuda in that fight earlier. And he goes, he couldn't. It was just too strong. He said Sine Kakuda was just too strong for him. As for Atsuka, oh my god. As for Atsuka, it was Pride 4 for him, where he secured an upset victory over legend Marco Huas. Now, though, we did see Atsuka at Pride 7 in that pro wrestling bout against his daddy, Nobuhiko Takada. <laughs> Just saying it like, what? like that sounds so fucking weird, dude. <laughs> we see Hickson Gracie in the corner of Henzo. We'll get to see more of Hickson in a little bit. And what the fuck is Alexander Otsuka wearing? I don't know if I can take his fucking shit right now. He's wearing a blue and pink shorts, and his fucking head is bandaged up. I mean, no, I, I do have to ask. What the fuck was Atsuka doing before this? Exactly. Because he's, no, he's got like bandage around the head, <laughs> fucking, uh, what was it, uh, a knee guard or yeah. some shit, uh, his ankle wrapped, <laughs> his toes wrapped. It's like, does this fucker get in a fucking like brawl at the fucking bar I have written the here, night before? Was Jesus. He, was he in a terrible car accident just days prior to this fight? Yeah. And he crawled out of the hospital to make it to the event. <laughs> no, that's, that's pretty much what it fucking was, dude. I'm like, I'm looking at him like, why are you fighting, dude? Exactly. You don't look like you should be fucking fighting. I figured either uh, before we actually find out later in the fight if he actually had something wrong with his head. I, I wrote here, is he really hurt or is he just being a goofy jack off? Well, I mean, with those shorts, I, I wouldn't put anything <laughs> past them. Like, holy shit, man. This goes not dead. The Japanese crowd begins to chant something as the two fighters stare each other down the, turn of mixed martial arts. the japanese the crowd begins to fighters. chant something as the two fighters yeah, stare like that. each other down but i can't seem to make it out any ideas any ideas no nope. we'll find probably out probably a disco song <laughs> we'll find out soon enough round one the men exchange the same exact low roundhouse kick which the crowd ooze over i think atsuka really really hustled in that fight and they come out trading kicks Atsuka goes for another kick and Henzo sticks him with a left and right Atsuka shoots in with a double leg and gets Henzo down to the mat and now he's in half guard I mean I'm gonna say that was a good takedown but I'm really fucking surprised it worked yeah, because yeah. it was so fucking telegraphed mm -hmm. like holy shit how did Henzo not get the fuck out of that way? <laughs> well, I think Henzo proved against Sine Kakuda he's not really good at avoiding the takedown. And I think if he had any holes in his game, especially around this time, Henzo would be his takedown defense. Yeah. But, of course, he's a jiu-jitsu guy, so I think he, he'd prefer guys to be on top where he can... Secure an arm bar or a triangle choke or something mm -hmm. like that. Asuka pounds away at Henzo's side and the crowd begins the chant again. Now I know what they are saying. Alanur, or something close to that, must be Japanese for Alexander. Quadros queries Boss on what diet butcher is. Boss <laughs> says he has no idea. This is a lot of action so far. Atsuka really pushing the action here. 
I've, I've always wondered, what does Diet Butcher mean? Is, is that his nickname? I, I really don't know. And if it's his nickname, how does that mean? Because I would think that Diet Butcher, the guy would maybe be overweight or something. Yeah, God knows, man. Maybe it's his sponsor. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm confused with it too, man. I, I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, Quadros has the same exact reservations about his nickname that we had back in Pride 4. Whatever the case, I think the Diet Butcher is just a random mismatch of English words that the Japanese don't really care what it alludes to, just that it sounds cool. Is that like a gardener? Because a butcher cuts <laughs> meat, but you can't have meat when you're on a diet. You can only have vegetables. Right. So you just chop up vegetables? Is that what you do <laughs> as a Diet Butcher? Otsuka with limp-wristed punches the Henzo's side. Even he even dead fish punches the mat. <laughs> Not <laughs> Not very good technique being shown by Asuka. Quadros and Boss get on the topic of pro wrestling. After Boss says that these pro wrestlers become very comfortable with the ring because of pro wrestling. You know, I was thinking about it. Why the pro wrestlers are doing so good in the real fighting. And I think it is because they are used to performing in front of an audience. They're doing a lot of acrobatic things. It costs a lot of energy, the things that they do. And I think it makes them more relaxed. It makes them, they do maybe a pro wrestling show every, every week or every two weeks, you know. It makes them very comfortable inside the ring and relaxed. And I think once you're relaxed, yeah, I don't think, I know once you're relaxed, you fight at your best. That must be. Quadro Slater says that pro wrestlers get more injured than MMA fighters because they get hit with chairs, baseball bats, and land on the outside uh, on their heads. Say that pro wrestling has a higher rate of injury than mixed martial art does. It's more dangerous. Oh, I believe so. Yep, I really believe so. I mean, it's true that the fights are, you know, predetermined, but nonetheless, there's a lot of damage you getting hit with chairs, with baseball bats, getting knocked out of the ring, landing on your head. <laughs> Quadros here doesn't sound like he's very knowledgeable about <laughs> wrestling. I don't see very many baseball bats. Unless you were watching yeah. WCW at the time and I, Yeah, and then, I mean, even then, it's like, you're not actually getting hit by that. <laughs> right, and it's a rubber baseball yeah, bat. I, I'm sorry, <laughs> listeners, for the you for those of you that don't know this, uh, wrestling is what we like to call not real. <laughs> so if you see someone getting hit, chances are they're not receiving the full fucking impact. <laughs> yes. Asuka straight up delivers chops. To Henzo's side. Asuka striking is really fucking garbage. And Asuka has lost his bandage around his head, and the motherfucker has a band aid under it on his forehead. Yeah, but it looks like he has stitches or something because that band aid's sticking out weirdly. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know what the fuck is going on. Oh, Henzo begins to possibly set up a leg triangle, which Atsuka escapes from, and there is a furious scramble immediately after with kicks from Gracie, and Henzo gets to his feet, puts Atsuka into a guillotine choke, and then slams him back to the mat where he loses his grips. Five minutes down in round one. Blood pours out of Atsuka's nose like a faucet. One of those kicks from Henzo must have busted his nose. No, there was one, like, when they were both on the ground, Henzo had landed one solid straight to his face. It was yeah. great. Now the band-aid is gone from Atsuka's head as well, and I can't really see anything there. Maybe he had a mole removed. More terrible striking from the top by Atsuka, but Boss actually approves, saying that Atsuka is hitting with the hard part of the bone in his hand. Otsuka is actually doing real good with the side of his hand, that's the bone. And uh, it, listen, it, it, it hurts way more. Three minutes left in round one. Henzo sets up another triangle choke attempt, but he doesn't have much here. But Henzo does the same push away on Atsuka, giving him enough room to stand up. There's a leg kick by Gracie, and Atsuka definitely felt that one. Yeah. I mean, and, and at that point, you can tell that his leg is injured, dude. Yeah, oh yeah. Like, like even before the fight started, just, you saw him get hit in that leg, and you saw his reaction, and it's like, holy shit, man. His knee must be all fucked up, and it's probably from pro wrestling. Mile away shooting by Atsuka, and Henzo easily sprawls and then gets back to his feet. Another leg kick by Henzo, and Atsuka is definitely favoring and protecting his leg now as he tries to pull it back from impact. Atsuka tries to shoot in, but he has no chance here. I mean, so, he's getting desperate. Yes. Plain and simple. He wants that takedown, and Henzo's scared of the takedown. 
But you can tell that, that Atsuka doesn't want to stay up. Henzo moves in close and Atsuka falls to his knees, wrapping Henzo up around the back of his thighs and taking him down. Atsuka is back in guard, but there's only one minute left in round one. Quadro says this has been Gracie's fight. And... This is, no, this round has been Atsuka's round. Play yeah, I don't simple. know what the fuck Quadro's is smoking. Asuka has been in a top position for most of the fight so far, so I don't see how you could say that this is Gracie's fight. Sweep attempt by Gracie, but it doesn't end up going anywhere. Small strikes by Asuka, and then the bell rings, ending round one. How how would you judge that round? Plain and simple, 100% Asuka. Hmm. I mean, I mean, Gracie had a couple good hits. I, I won't give him that. I, I won't take that away from him. He he landed a couple good kicks, especially on Asuka's bad leg. But for the most part, Atsuka just, you know, he had the takedowns. He had the control when they were on the ground. Absolutely. I would have given it. I'm going to agree with the Colombian here. I would have well, yeah. given it in round one to Atsuka as well. It's unanimous. Round two. Missing kicks by both men. As Henzo winds up some punches, Atsuka ducks down and takes Gra Gracie to the mat. In the corner, fresh blood streams from Atsuka's nose. Boss tells a story of him demonstrating the chop that Atsuka is using. And every time I say chop, I'm demonstrating it. <laughs> so they know. <laughs> Karate chop. <laughs> it's strange how Alexander Atsuka throws that left hand. It's almost like he's throwing a ridge hand. Yeah, they call it Kansetsugiri. It's the inside here. It's very hard. I demonstrate one time when a reporter here in Japan asked me if, there was a, if it hurt. And I, for fun, gave him one on his leg. I think it could work it well. <laughs> but it, it, it was a friend of mine, so that was okay. Don't worry about it. Well, if you do that to your friends, then what do you do to your enemies? <laughs> Not much to report here, as Atsuka simply looks to hold Gracie down, lightly tapping his side with chops. Atsuka's face is a complete mess. But I mean, at this point, maybe it's just me, but he's bleeding from where he had that band-aid. He might be down too, yes. yeah. 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 So whatever he had there, he I think did he have has something. like a little cut, actually. Yeah. And what I was joking when I said maybe he got a mole removed. I think he had a little cut. Henzo looks to escape or move away, but he accomplishes nothing. Quadros talks about the evolution of MMA as a sport, how it went from no judges, no time limits, to more structured fights, and how it has been necessary. I really like how this sport is progressing. We've gone from unlimited time limits, no judges. Now we have time limits, we have overtime, we have judges, we have fighters that are better prepared to attack in a variety of different ways. The fights are definitely getting more exciting. Rehenzo suddenly rolls for an armbar and surprisingly, Atsuka manages to escape, although it looked pretty deep. Definitely close one, and now Henzo is on top in side control. Thanks to my wife for pointing this note out, but Henzo's thigh is pretty fucking gross with burn scars. No information found online. I did tweet Henzo asking him about it. He never replied. Five minutes are down in round two and we're still here until Asuka mistakenly tries to pull Henzo over his own chest, which allows Henzo to get into mount. Terrible position for Atsuka. Henzo, though, jumps right out of mount and back into side control. He then knees Atsuka's body. Henzo gets back on mount, then goes back to side control again. Henzo has Atsuka wrapped up tight, but he isn't doing a whole lot. Some more knees by Henzo, and Atsuka tries his own pathetic knee that literally does nothing. <laughs> left in round two. Atsuka suddenly manages to roll away and Henzo tries a vicious soccer kick at Atsuka as he attempts to stand. We're back to standing now. For I mean, that whiff, man. I felt the wind right oh, here in my face. Jesus. If, if, it, <laughs> if that would have hit, he would have been fucking jacked up. <laughs> We're back to standing now for both men. Leg kick by Henzo to which Atsuka tries a right punch. The men grapple and Henzo manages to slip behind Atsuka before neatly German suplexing him back to the mat. There's the low kick. 
Nice. Oscar going for the body lock. Hanzo getting his back. Oh. Hanzo with an over the shoulder suplex against the pro wrestler. And plain and simple, I, I'm going to say this because I know uh, Boss and Quadra mentioned it. You know, first of all, beautiful suplex. Mm -hmm. Fucking cleanly done. And the irony of a beautiful suplex like that getting done on a pro wrestler. Yeah. It was not lost <laughs> yeah, on me. Either. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, this is the first time we've seen a, a really nice German suplex like that. Uh, we will get to see a very, very famous German suplex down in Pride. I think circa 2003. We'll have to wait for that one, fans. Oh, who am I talking about here? Henzo's in sort of a backside control. Just one minute remaining now in round two, but nothing really happens. Taking us all the way to the bell. 20 I, minutes down, and we'll go to the judges. Before that, I will say this, because I noticed it. Henzo really fucking likes using the ropes. Mm. Really likes every oh, yeah. once in a while. Oh, yeah, you'll see right. him. And he will grab that rope and use it as leverage. It's yeah. not like it's not like his hand just landed there. He will fucking grab the rope and pull on it. I should have wrote that down because yeah, I noticed it, uh, several times where Henzo blatantly grabs the ropes and uses them, uh, and the refs would have. I mean, none of but them. but the refs like what happened since last Pride? Because last Pride the refs were motherfucking there. Yeah, all over it. And smacking hands. Yeah. And smacking hands, right? Or, or no, wait, it wasn't this. It was the other thing that we no, watched. No, yeah, no. We watched um, We watched uh, Rising. Yes, yeah, so yeah, the, the, yeah. Rising, they, they had, were right there just yeah. slapping the fucking no, shit out of me. Rising had like 10 guys on the outside of the ring at any time ready to fucking hit those hands or okay, push them yeah, away. Yeah. Now, now that I think back to it, yes, I was confused. You're right. Pride sucks at this. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Oh, and so we're at the judges waiting for the fate of our fighters, and, oh, as I burp, it's declared a unanimous decision for Henzo Gracie. Boo! Motherfucking boo! Henzo Gracie, winner via decision after two rounds. Yes, what the fuck? You, that was clearly a draw. It was. We should have gotten a third round. A final and fucking, Yeah, plain and fucking simple. And I, if anyone was... If you would expect, if anyone were to get a gift decision, it would be the Japanese fighter because they're in Japan. Japanese judges. The the only reason I I realized that you're right, except for one, for one exception, the Gracie name. Oh yeah, it's true. Because and I know Boss and Quadro mentioned it. Up until this point, the Gracie name is undefeated. Yeah. Oh yeah, all, all the Gracies in Pride are undefeated. Exactly. So that's the thing is I don't think that I I think that the refs. Where the little the judges were a little bit too fucking nice to keep that streak alive. Possibly shenanigans, viewers. I call. If you think so, let us know. What's that place, uh, Farva, with all the shit on the walls? Our shenanigans are cheeky and fun. Yeah, I mean his shenanigans are cruel and tragic, which makes them not shenanigans at all, really. Evil shenanigans. I swear to God, I'll pistol whip the next guy that says shenanigans. <clears throat> Hey, Farva, what's the name of that restaurant you like with all the goofy shit on the walls and the mozzarella sticks? You mean shenanigans? No! Oh. <laughs> 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 you, you mean shenanigans? <laughs> I want you to splice that fucking part of that movie. <laughs> uh, any final thoughts on this fight? Uh, I hate Hamdell Gracie. So that, <laughs> that 55 minute ordeal he put yeah. me through watching oh, yeah. that fight, I'll never like, I, I'll never forgive him for that. Never. I, I was, I was really just gonna just skip this fight and just go, nope, I'm not watching. It. <laughs> I, I will say this. What the fuck was Atsuka doing fighting? Right. I mean, I mean, here's the thing: is he, to, you know, we 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 decided that he he should have won round one. Yeah. Plain and simple, right. right? We should, we would have given it to him. Think about what would have happened had he been healthy. Oh yeah, like absolutely. you know, because one hit, one kick to his leg, he was, and, yeah. and it was stupid because even then, like second round, he was leading with the fucking bad leg. Yeah. I'm like, what the fuck are you doing, you dumbass? <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. Um, I thought it was an okay fight. I disagreed with the decision, but it was an entertaining fight. It went yeah. It went pretty quick. It, I know. It did. It did. I, I, I will say that. It was a good fight. For being, yeah, for being the full time. Right. So, what would become of our two diet butchering fighters here? Alexander Otsuka would return for the 2000 Grand Prix, where he will draw Igor Volchanskin. <laughs> Fucking bandages, you gotta be wearing for that fucking. <laughs> <laughs> His whole body he looks like a fucking mummy. Oh, uh, uh, that's not gonna be good for old Oscar there. As for Henzo, we want to see him back in Pride until Pride 10, Return of the Warriors, which would take place in August of 2000. There, he'll take on Kazushi Sakuraba. Hell's yeah, man. See you next time, boys. which sees a returning Francisco Bueno, who stands 5'9", was 222 pounds, and was 26 years old at the time. Bueno's MMA record as of this fight was 2-1. and one. He's facing off against a returning Igor Volchanskin, who stands 5'8", was 235 pounds, and was 26 years old at the time. Igor's MMA record, meanwhile, was 41-2 and two with one no contest. Francisco Bueno hasn't fought since Pride 5, where he beat the great head of hair, Satoshi Hama. Igor, meanwhile, is on a tear, and this is definitely the toughest fight Bueno will ever have. Pre-fight, Quadro states that Bueno has been training boxing for two years with the same man who trained Rocky Marciano. Bueno has been oh, training wow. in boxing for two Jacques years Jacques under Jacques the same Jacques. coach, who coached the legendary Francisco! Rocky Marciano. Wow. Bueno! And who's that? What? Fuck. <laughs> who's it? Well, say his name, Quadros. The same guy that trained Rocky Marciano for Francisco Bueno. Hey, Rocky Marciano ain't shit. Fuck a bad Joe Lewis. Rocky Marciano ain't shit. <laughs> <laughs> Quadro says that Bueno wanted either Kerr or Vorchanchkin, and he gets what he wanted in Igor. I don't think you really wanted this, Bueno. I mean, that's that's like a monkey paw wish. It's like, <laughs> I wish to fight with Mark Kerr or Igor. Bam. I and want, you fight Igor. Yeah. It's like, fuck. I want, yeah, I, want, I want the big time. I want to fight in the big time. And they're like, okay, you're fighting Igor Vorchanchkin. <laughs> Before the round began. Mm. I will say two things. One thing. First, holy shit, leg size difference. Oh, yeah. Like, Igor's just fucking, like, his legs tank. are like, yeah. yeah, like, Bueno has fucking, like, dainty legs compared to Igor. Oh, yeah. And then the other thing is, the more I look at Igor and the more I look at him, it's like, I'm like, this motherfucker has to be related to Putin. Just to, like, his, fa <laughs> yeah. his face looks he does, like Putin. He actually does kind of look like uh, Vladimir Putin. Yeah, I'm like, I'm like, I, I can understand where Putin gets the badassness because fucking Igor can <laughs> yes. beat up a bear, three bears at the fucking same time, blindfolded, both hands tied behind his back. Yes. Round one. Stand up and circling as Bueno looks rather hesitant to engage, staying far on the outside. But he does have some sweet, sweet twinkle toes moves, man. Yeah, you, you see his legs like fucking 
Muhammad Ali style, just go all over the place. He's well, getting walked down. <laughs> well, Chanchkin moves in, keeping Bueno against the ropes and in the corner. And then suddenly, kaboom! Igor hits Bueno with a one, two, and Bueno, before he even hits the fucking ground, is out cold. He face plants to the mat, and that is it. Igor Volchanskin has starched Francisco Bueno at 1 minute and 23 seconds of the first round. Maybe a more dangerous striker. Oh, big right oh hand God. by Volchanskin! Oh, oh my, my God! God. Volchanskin has knocked out Francisco Bueno. A crushing right oh, hand, wow. followed by two more punches. Volchanskin shadow boxing. Wow, Bueno looks fucking dead, and there's about 10 Japanese officials surrounding him, and one's checking his pulse! By the way, I, I will say this, pretty fucking yeah. asshole move from, Qua, from Boss. He's like, <laughs> just move him aside, move him aside, guys! Put him to the side, guys. Hello, I guess what was tongue, maybe? I'm like, this fucker's dead, man. We might need a stretcher. How the fuck are they gonna move him aside? You know, it's not good when you have one of the officials. Yeah, checking I seen that. I, I was like, oh well, yeah, you might want to do that though. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, no, like honestly, he falls. Like, no, he's starting to flutter his eyes a little yeah. bit. It, it, like the mo when he first was falling, he fell on the ground face first, mm -hmm. and his eyes were open. Yeah. So I'm like, fuck is dead. Yeah. Plain and fucking simple. Because like I'm like, that punch broke his jaw or some shit like yeah. that. You see how the mouthpiece came out too. Yeah, no, it was it was see, I missed that, but I have to look at it and you didn't see how the mouthpiece no. came out? Oh, oh my yeah. God. It was it was fucking brutal. Like I'm like, this fucker's dead, plain and yeah. fucking simple. I, I was glad when like they, they they pan to his face and all of a sudden you see him like slightly blink. I'm like, alright, alright, he might just be retarded for the rest of his life, but at least he's alive. Well what's funny is yeah, his eyes were like Stuck open, like no movement, nothing at all. They were just open, yeah. And then, and then you see, he 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 like snapped out of it. Yeah, yeah, which was good because I honestly thought. He was <laughs> yeah, I'm sure the Japanese officials were fucking. And, and I'm thought, and I'm thought, yeah. I'm glad that the the official, like the moment he saw the ice blade, he just fucking puts his hand over his face, like don't fucking move, man, yeah. don't fucking move. And boss, although I don't think it it causes much damage, it, boss said it did. But when he was going down, uh, Igor hits him with another. Oh, Igor hit him a couple times as he was going down, and that probably didn't help no but he was already out yeah, from the first hit feet. but no it's not even that it's, it's i don't think anything did as much damage as the first contact no. i was watching this right with my girlfriend she looks down on her phone she's like shit it's already over you know, <laughs> So, what would become of our two super beef tank brawlers here? Igor Volchanskin will be returning for the 2000 Grand Prix, where, as I said just before, he will be fighting Alexander Otska. As for Bueno, this would be the last time we'll see old Chico in Pride. Yeah, there was no Bueno. <laughs> <laughs> he would only fight a few more times in his career against no one of consequence. His next fight after Pride 8 would be in June of 2001 at the World Valley Tudo Championships number 12, where he would face off against Mexican heavyweight Mariano Mendoza. Funny thing about this fight, you can see it on YouTube, and Mar Mariano Mendoza himself actually comments, hey, that's me, <laughs> as he's getting his ass kicked <laughs> by Francisco Bueno. <laughs> he's like, hey, that's, that's me in this fight. And he told a, a YouTube uploader, you spelled my name wrong. It's it's Mendoza, and a guy had it like uh, Mendoza, uh, Mendoza with an S. Instead yeah, and he said it was E, yeah. yeah. So I'm like, this, this can't be real, the fucking guy. Oh, uh, good stuff. Chico would rear naked choke Mendoza in the first round. Bueno would end his MMA career in 2007 after a decision loss at Gladiator Challenge 69, held in California. Hey, 69. <laughs> held in California <laughs> in September of that year. Bueno would finish his MMA career with a record of 5 and 2. We'll catch you some other time, Bueno. fight to lose or to draw, he goes for a win, and I believe he can win. I promise, I do my heart and my blood to do this.
Mr. Sakuraba is a great fighter, but I believe with the techniques Hoyler has, Hoyler will win. Which sees a returning Hoyler Gracie who stands 5'8. Hoyler. Hoyler. <laughs> I don't know where these fucker Gracies came up with their names. He stands 5'8, was 150 pounds, and was 33 years old at the time. Hoyler's MMA record as of this fight was 3 and 0. He's facing off against a returning Kazushi Shakaraba who stands 6 foot was 183 pounds and was 30 years old at the time. The Sakura fucking pride of Japan. The pride How about of Japan, it? yeah. Sakuraba's MMA record at this time was 6-1-1 one, and one with one no contest. Lots of hype for this fight. It gets a big video package played beforehand with interviews from Hickson and Hoyler talking about the fight. And the inclusion of Hickson kind of makes it feel like this is a big thing for the Gracies. Hoyler is coming in giving up about 30 pounds. But if you remember Hoyler's last fight in Pride against Yu Yuhi Sano, that fact didn't matter then either. Special note on this fight, we're going to be treated to unique time limits. Why the fuck is this happening? I have no idea. All the previous fights on this card have been two 10 minute rounds, but instead we're going to get 15 minutes per round. And apparently there are no judges in this fight. So I guess they were prepared to go unlimited time for the second round. We won't go until it's done. By God the way, where, where, the, where the rules established in the beginning? Because where they? Because I didn't hear that, and as I was watching the fight, I'm like, I looked at the the, the time on my video. I'm like, that's that's not ten minutes. Well, I, I'll get to it, but Boss kind of uh, figures it out for himself. Boss didn't even know what the fuck the round ties were. He kind of goes, did they just say uh, fifteen minutes? By the way, as, as far as entrances go, I was disappointed in Sakuraba. He had the douche major with him. <laughs> oh, I'm like, yeah. why, why the fuck would you bring him in yes, with you? Yes, Takata. Oh, God. The rivalry continues. Hicks and Gracie and Takata. Fuck him. Uh, fuck no, him. Fuck him good. Actually, to be a rivalry, I think you need one of the uh, people to be a competitor in the rivalry. Yeah. So, so the, <laughs> this this fight would be a great rivalry. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Takeda yeah. in the ring doesn't fuck it. He, and, he maybe rivals what uh, a fucking grade schooler. <laughs> and yeah, and the fact that Hicks and Gracie versus Sakuraba spoilers everybody, it would never happen is a travesty because imagine how big that fight would have been. Oh my god. It would have been bigger for Japan than Takada versus Hickson, which turned out to be a fucking joke. Pathetic joke, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. But now if you had Sakuraba versus oh, Hickson. Beautiful fucking holy fight. Holy shit. Anyway, let's get out of it. Round one. Sakuraba misses with a kick. Shortly after, Hoyler rushes in for a takedown and Sakuraba sprawls. Hoyler then pulls guard. The men battle here in kind of an awkward position. So, I don't know if it happens here, and I forgot to write down the time for this, hmm. but I, 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 Boss and Quattro start talking about how Sakuraba has actually never fought someone smaller than him. I mean, and, and, and it's kind of weird because it made me realize, yeah, Fighting someone smaller is a complete different strategy oh, yeah. than fighting someone bigger. Sure, yeah. And Sakuraba still fucking doing it, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we are in an awkward position here, which is devoid of any strikes. And at this point, I'm kind of disheartened as I think it's going to turn into a straight-up grappling bout. Little body punches by Sakuraba, who is being hugged very intensely by Hoyler. It looks like the scene from Ghost. Wait for me, wait for me. I'll be coming home, wait for me.
Yeah. Ghost. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm, I'm expecting them to start fucking doing pottery at this fucking point, man. <laughs> I'm gonna have to include it right now. I'm ghost. Uh, some punches by Hoyler gets under Sakuraba's skin, and he thrusts a few back, his anger rising. Then he begins to alter his position. Sakuraba then stands up, and Hoyler does as well. Just missing head kick by Sakuraba. Hoyler pushes forward and gets Sakuraba into the ropes. Hoyler then changes levels and tries to get Sakuraba's legs, but Sakuraba blocks it. Sakuraba sits on Hoyler and begins to pound away at him. Hoyler kicks him away and then follows a standing Sakuraba with kicks, chases him around from his ass. And hey, that's something he's done a lot. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's one of those things that, at this point, he lets me know that he doesn't think he can win otherwise. Because he's done that before. When, when he's being out technique, <clears throat> he will stay on the ground. And it pisses me off that the ref won't stand him up. Right. And I'm wondering if because he is probably one of the smaller Gracies, all the other Gracies are about 200 pounds, I'm wondering if this is what he has to do in training because the bigger guys, the bigger Gracies always fucking throw him to the ground. And yeah, yeah. And I, and, I, and I see that, like you said, it is a valid strategy. Mm-hmm. It's just not a good way. To no, it's fight. valid if the guy stands right in front of you, but Sakurab is too smart. He's gotten too smart for that. Five minutes are down in round one. Leg kick by Sakuraba with a big rise coming from the crowd. Then another, and another, and then a teasing jump. Another leg kick, then a lightning kick to the face of Hoyler, who visibly reacts, maybe wondering if it was even legal. Macias and throwing the right roundhouse kick for oh, Chase. Oh, he kicked him right in the head. face, right in the face. Hoyler then begins to taunt or goad Sakuraba to come down into his guard. Oh my god, that's so fucking stupid. It's like, Sakuraba's beating you in every shape and form. Don't fucking taunt him. Sakuraba keeps up with the kick attacks, then Hoyler gets back to his feet. The PA announcer is confused here, saying, Last three minutes! But that's only seven minutes down. We still have <laughs> eight more minutes to go. So nobody knows what fucking time limit yes. this fucking fight is. I guess Pride was very bad at communicating the rules, even to the PA guy, as he doesn't know what the fuck is going on. Nice late kick by Sakuraba that unbalances Hoyler. Hoyler moves in and tries to pull guard, but Sakuraba won't have any of it. Hoyler from the mat continues to chase Sakuraba around, and Sakuraba is content to chip away at Hoyler's legs. Boss states that there is a new rule just for this fight, that the ref will not stand the fighters. And I think there is a new rule again, uh, at least in this fight, that the referee doesn't put them up, you see? You're fucking bullshitting, boss. I don't think that was the actual rule, and I don't think anyone told you that was the rule. I think that's him guessing. But it's a good guess. After listening to that, it makes sense. It makes sense. Because, yeah. you know, there's been a couple fights, I think the last couple prides, where they have stood up people really fast. Yeah. And they're not doing it now, and they fucking should be doing it. So the fact that there might be a rule stating that, A, I don't I see I see Hoyler as having signed up for that rule. Yes. Because like you said, he's probably really good at fighting from the ground. So I don't you know, giving up the weight probably said, hey, I will give up the weight, but don't stand me up. And I think this was, and I think I do get into this a little bit, or at least Quadros does, and I comment on it. The Gracies were notorious for demanding special rules for their fights. And at that time, they fucking could. I mean, it's it's like, you know, fucking in the 90s, going up to a bold one and, ask, and, and asking them to be in a movie. <laughs> they can tell you whatever the fuck they yeah. want. They you gotta have this in the trailer. Yeah. You gotta have bitches on, on demand right there ready. <laughs> Hard kick by Sakuraba, and Hoyler definitely felt it as he visibly rubs the spot. More of the same, Sakuraba kicks and faints, and Hoyler just scoots around on his ass. Hoyler seems to be taunting anyway, jabbing away at Sakuraba. More kicks from Sakuraba, and Hoyler's legs are fucking getting destroyed. Hoyler continues to jaw jack the- Hoyler, truly frustrated. Motioning Sakuraba down. Yeah, Sakuraba says, why should I go down? I'm punching right now from the from the top. So at this point, I'm pretty sure because because of what it is, it's boss. <laughs> boss says, 
I can feel it. And I'm like, <laughs> wow, boss, are you, that, that didn't sound, you know. Oh, Hoyler continues to jaw jack, but Sakuraba simply won't bite. Hoyler needs to get his ass up, but he doesn't. I do have that note. I'm like, come on, ref, stand this bitch up. Yes. <laughs> Sakuraba kicks Hoyler, who is visibly in pain. And so Sakuraba decides to focus right on that spot, wailing away with kicks. And the longer he stays in this position, the more the legs are going to be hurt, the more difficult it's oh, going to be. Oh, look at that. Oh, 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 this fight oh, may be on the verge oh. of being over. Sakuraba just going crazy here with the right roundhouse kick, the left roundhouse kick. Hoyler's legs are going to be like rubber when he does finally stand. Hoyler continues to beg Sakuraba to come down into his guard. The PA announcer gets it right this time, <laughs> saying once again, last three minutes. Twelve minutes are down in round one. Quadro says this has turned into a bit of a mismatch, and I agree. Hoyler is simply outclassed here. Well, this has turned into a bit of a mismatch. Taunting axe kick from Sakuraba and then more leg kicks. Sakuraba then offers his hand out to help Hoyler stand up. Fucking hilarious. <laughs> Last one minute of the round sees more of the same with Sakuraba toying with Hoyler. And it looks as though the round will end here. And it does. The bell rings ending round one. So <clears throat> it's it's kind of funny because right, like, right before that, Bob's required to make a, make a reference about how, how size... like. Size doesn't matter or whatever. When you've got two great fighters in the ring, size absolutely matters. <laughs> and I'm like, dude, it's MMA. Size always matters. Yes. You know, it's like dick size. Yeah. The smaller, <laughs> the smaller it is, the more work you have to do. <laughs> oh. Oh. So I'm sure you have to do a lot of work with the one. <laughs> Hoyler surprisingly gets up rather effortlessly and has no trouble walking. I'm kind of taken aback by that. Boss says it's a good thing that the doctors come before the fight and make sure you clip your nails as they replay the slicing kick to Hoyler's face. And this there it one, is. Probably. And this nicks him right there. Oh, oh my God. It was just the tip of the toes whacking up across the side of his face. And that, that's got a little bit of a whip. I'm surprised they didn't scratch his face. You know, it's a good thing that the doctors always come before the fight and they look at your nails, they let you clip your nails because right. this would have been like... That would have tore up his face. Oh, yes. If it, if it were that long toenails. But even with short toenails. Look like you ha just had been clawed by Freddy Krueger. Takata, we see him in fucking Sakuraba's, right behind Sakuraba. Suck my dick, Takata. <laughs> he looks very happy with this punishment being dished out on one of the Gracies. Yes, Takeda, this is what it looks when someone's fucking talented. <laughs> yes. Don't fucking smile, go fucking train. Maybe you can do it too. Round two, standoff before Hoyler stomps forward and gets a hold of Sakuraba's hands before thinking of going low. Sakuraba though, pops him with a knee. Then there's an overhand right that follows by Hoyler. After Sakuraba thinks about a kick, he sticks Hoyler with a nice right hook. Inside leg kick, big cheers from the crowd. At this point is when I actually notice that Sakuraba's shorts, one, once again, weird fucking color, very colorful. I mean, the, the Japanese decided tonight was disco dancing time. Yeah. Uh, but if he wins this fight, he should just point to Gracie and just in English say, you got iced. <laughs> <laughs> Back fist bitch slap misses by Sakuraba. Boss is calling for a high kick here. Sakuraba should throw a right high kick. That's what I think right now. Here. Another leg kick by Sakuraba. Missing leg swing by Hoyler. And then boom, there's the high kick. Boss won it. It's almost if he had watched this fight beforehand. <laughs> <laughs> Hoyler flies back to his ass. Quadros and Boss are in a near frenzy here, along with the crowd, which is going absolutely fucking nuts. Hunt connected to us. Oh, my God! There you go! It was the right high kick, and it knocked Royal to the canvas. Man, we're just talking about him. More kicks here, and then Hoyler is able to stand up. More punishment, though, to Hoyler's legs, then an upper body kick, another painful leg kick, and Hoyler tries to step in and grab, but Sakuraba manages to avoid it. I made a note here because I, I, no, I noticed it from Gracie this entire time with his approaches, man. I'm, and it, here it is. 
I've seen nerds with more confidence talking to women than with Gracie trying to approach Sakuraba. <laughs> yeah. He looks like he's about to shit a brick every time he takes a step forward. Yes. Kind of rightfully so. <laughs> Sakuraba walks Hoyler back and Hoyler shoots in and misses five minutes down in round two. Hoyler continues to try and stomp forward onto Sakuraba's lead leg, perhaps an attempt to set up something, or maybe he's just trying to position Sakuraba. He then delivers a nice right. Another high kick by Sakuraba, and then a body kick, then a leg kick. Quadro states that this fight has no judges, and it must end with a knockout or submission. This is when I found out about the rules, by the way. Yes. <laughs> I'm saying that here. <laughs> Another special rule likely agreed upon by fighters. Sweet spinning back kick by Sakuraba that lands, then another hard leg kick, then one that trips Hoyler. And more abuse on the Hoyler's legs as he is back down with his ass on the mat. Hoyler's legs are long already bruised and purple. Hoyler stands, gets another stiff leg kick. Big whiff by Hoyler. Quadros and Boss get on the subject of judges and how they are a necessity for the credibility of the sport. Some people don't like judges, but in order to make this into a mainstream sport, we have to have judges because not all fights end for, before the distance in a knockout or submission. Of, of course we do, and we need all the same set of rules for every fight. And how that not allowing special rules to be... <laughs> you don't think so? I like how they're doing it like... They're doing a Thunderdome style, two men yeah. and one man. You know what I mean? They really are. But they, so there's got to be a knockout or submission, or you, ain't, you just do it forever. It's a hardcore match. Right. What's <laughs> funny here, though, is that Quadros also says that how not allowing special rules to be interjected into fights is important. And when he's commenting on a fight that has all sorts of special rules interjected into it, he says that the sport needs to get away from that. Uh, I don't think he noticed the irony there. <laughs> Another back kick by Sakuraba, but it misses. Hoyler ducks a Sakuraba punch and then sits on the mat. Sakuraba finally takes the bait and goes down into Hoyler's guard. Hoyler jaws at him, likely saying words Sakuraba simply doesn't comprehend. Sakuraba stands and then grabs Hoyler's feet, pulling him like it's a fucking comedy act. He's probably going to drag him. He's going to drag him, he's going to drag him around the ring. <laughs> It is so funny. Oh. He then kicks his legs. Ten minutes are down in round two. And Boss, at this point, after the announcer says ten minutes have passed, he's confused. He says, how many minutes? <laughs> Sakuraba punching at the legs now. How many minutes, they said? Ten? I'm not sure. 50, I think. 10? Quadros has no idea what the fuck is going on either. You can hear Hoyler say, let's go, come on. And just a note here, despite having to take English in school, most Japanese people really don't care to learn or retain any English. So Sakuraba likely has no idea what the fuck Hoyler is saying, despite it being in English. But I mean, I, I'm pretty sure he understands because Hoyler's not just saying it, he's also giving him the little Motions. hand motion. You're right. So Sakuraba <laughs> probably knows, and he's probably thinking to himself, why? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm winning this fight, plain and fucking simple. How about you just have to come up here to prove who the fuck you are? <laughs> But Hoyler has once again successfully baited Sakuraba down into his guard. From this position, Hoyler encourages Sakuraba with yeah, 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 and then says something I can't exactly make out. But Boss sure does make it out. Boss thinks he says, finish me. Okay, now Hoyler's saying, yeah, just give me the arm, throw the arm straight out. Finish me, finish me. Finish me. <laughs> so Hoyler is asking Sakuraba to finish him. I mean, it's it's one. I think it's one of those things yeah, where got, he doesn't think tired, he can. I got shit to do. <laughs> yeah, like hurry up and finish it. Or maybe he's trying to. I, I think he just he don't he doesn't think Sakuraba can, and he's want he's wanting because he's not gonna win by normal means. He's not gonna win by his own merits. So he's hoping Sakuraba fucks up somewhere and exactly. he can explode. I think he's at he's imploring Sakuraba to try and finish him so he can catch Sakuraba as Sakuraba gets overly aggressive. Yeah, and I think so. Yeah. Sakuraba stands back up. He delivers another kick. Sakuraba asks that Hoyler stands too. Who does? They touch gloves with a good show of sportsmanship. Positioning stomp once again by Hoyler, and he tries to grab Sakuraba. 
Hoyler pulls down and now Sakuraba is in deep on top of Hoyler. Sakuraba then latches on a Kimura. Quadro says this is one of Sakuraba's signature moves in the gym. And in a very Mark Kerr-like fashion, Sakuraba puts Hoyler's arm behind him and begins to step over his shoulder. Holy shit, it looks fucking painful. Yeah. He keeps ratcheting it back further and further. This looks super painful and very dangerous. After a lull, Sakuraba applies more pressure and I know Hoyler has to be fucking feeling this and then more pressure. Ouch. I mean, it's, it's I, I was actually kind of scared at this point. Yes. No, because it's like that arm looked like it could pop at any fucking second. Yeah. And, and this is this is a part I don't understand. Normally, you know, if the wrestler gets to tap, sure. But Gracie's hand was right under Sakuraba, like his left hand. So even if he even tried to tap, you wouldn't be able to see it that well. Right. Again, so this is like the Mark Kerr where Pedro's hand was trapped. Yeah. And Mark Kerr did the same move, stepped behind, and was fucking pulling that back. And Pedro had no way to fucking tap. Exactly. And it's, and it's kind of scary. Oh, you can verbally submit now. Yeah, he can well, verbally submit. I mean, it's one of those things that... Fighters are more used to tapping, right. but if your hands trap like that, you're not going to be tapping noticeably. Or you, could, uh, or you could be like Frank Beer versus Noguera, where he's not doing shit, he just right. lets you break it. Uh, and here's the thing, is it, here's what I say, is he, Gracie has not done much this fight. He has been dominated by Sakurao, and this, 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 this Nomura, he is not going to be getting loose out of it. So, so at this point is... For me, Gracie is just being stubborn, and he is risking a lot of injury that he really fucking shouldn't because he's not going to fucking win this fight. That's why I brought up the Noguera thing, though. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. And so, the ref must have felt exactly as the good vibe does, because without warning, as Sakuraba continues to put this arm further and further behind Hoyler, the ref jumps in and stops the fight likely believing he was showing Hoyler mercy. And and he was because honestly for me I don't think I don't think his arm would have broken. I think it would have popped out of his socket cuz yeah. his yeah. his shoulder was looking No, his arm was like in a position that you can't possibly recreate. No, no, like, it was it was ridiculous and Gracie was not getting out of that. Plain and fucking simple. No. And, and even if he was, like I said, this entire fight has been Sakuraba's. There's pandemonium! The bell rings! Sakuraba is declared the winner! Boss and Quadros are completely confused. Because now he's pushing the leg against his own leg. You see, he cannot go any further. Right. No, 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 no. Okay, the referee has moved in. The referee is waiting to fight off. The referee has stopped the fight. Wow, yeah, I, uh, in Hoyler's defense, I don't know. Well, Hoyler's looking, wait a minute. But the crowd is absolutely elated. Except this guy, <laughs> that fucking stone-faced Japanese guy that they cut to, who I guess is an official in K1. K1. Something or, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Hoyler gets up. He claps in a very sarcastic manner. He obviously believes this fight was a sham. He laughs and shows that he never tapped out. Hickson is protesting to an official on the outside. Quadro states at this point that now Hickson has to fight Sakuraba. But as I said, spoiler, that fight would never happen. Hoyler is pissed off now and he gets right in Sakuraba's face. Before we get a definitive conclusion, the broadcast is ended here and Quadros quickly signs us off. I guess they were really running out of space. Gentlemen, what were your thoughts on this? Kind of strange ending to this fight. I, I agree with it 100%, man. Like, Sakuraba dominated, and Gracie was not going to get out of that. I think he was just, just you know, trying to save face, trying to save name. You know, because like, like we mentioned before, is the Gracies had not lost before. So that's a lot. That's probably sure. a lot of fucking pressure on you. Sure. So he he's risking some fucking serious injury by family pride all that you know what yeah. i mean the gracies almost never tap i've only seen maybe in some of the brazilian jiu-jitsu competitions the gracies tap a couple times but in mma they 
never fucking tell. I know, and 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 it's kind of stupid because he was not going to win this fight. I will say that I feel Hoyler does have a right to be upset because if he wasn't going to tap, he wasn't going to tap. But if it would have came to it where a breakage did happen, then the referee would have had no choice but to come in and mm-hmm. stop it. And then Hoyler probably he wouldn't have anything to complain about. But the fact that it didn't happen, but he- I mean that doesn't. I, I will say this that. Even like back then, it would not have made a good show no. to have someone's arm getting fucking torn right. apart like that. And you know what? I think the ref was in the right to kind of, like I said, kind of take mercy on, on Hoyler here and stop it before something gross happened. Yes. Well, I see where you're coming from, though, too, where he just got room to base. Maybe he could just wait it out the round and got, you know what I mean? And right. then if they're just going to keep going until they finish it, you know but maybe that's what he was hoping for. But, but was, there, was there going to be an end to the round? Yeah, it would have, and they would have just went to more rounds. Oh, okay. So, what would become of our two supreme grapplers here? Sakuraba would return for the 2000 Grand Prix. His opening round opponent, a returning guy, Mesger. Definitely stay tuned for that one. As for Hoyler Gracie, he would never return to Pride, likely out of resentment and anger over this outcome. He would go on to win the ADCC, that's the Abu Dhabi Combat Club, World Championship in the 65 Kilo Division three years in a row, first in 1999, 2000, and then 2001. His next MMA battle, though, would be at Deep, First Impact, in January 2001. How deep does it go? (laughs) Is it first? Is it first impact? <laughs> wink, wink. He would controversially lose that fight by a draw against Genki Sudo. Those two would have a rematch though in 2004 at one of the K1 MMA cards, which was K1 MMA Romanex, whatever the fuck that means. And Genki would KO Hoyler in the first round. Hoyler would retire in 2006 after a decision loss to Hideo Tokoro at K1 Premium 2006 Dynamite. K1 and their fucking crazy MMA names. But then he would come out of retirement and fight one last time in 2011 at the age of 46 against Masakasu Ueda at Amazon Force Combat 1 in Brazil. <laughs> what the fucking these, these promotion names are fucking insane. Amazon Force Combat 1. <laughs> it takes place in Brazil. Brazil does have a corn. They just take... Well, here's how it works. <laughs> they take four darts and a board <laughs> that has action words. <laughs> and it's like, all right, first, where is this going to take place? In the Amazon. All right. What's going to take place? Action. (laughs) Hoyler would lose that fight as well by a split decision. So Hoyler would end his MMA career with a record of 5-5-1. Hey, what? You, you ever seen? Yeah, ever seen like the fucking the movie made with um with Vince Vaughn? Yeah. It's like you five five and one. You come, <laughs> you come say that the whole time. It's like you're gonna retire. You're five five and one. Winning record after eleven fights. That you'd be more than happy to talk to Max concerning the job. Yeah, and and it was a draw tonight. And I'm five five and one. And five five and one. That's not a winning record. Yeah, it's not a losing record. But Bob, it's not what you said. You said if you didn't have a winning record after eleven fights, you'd be happy Just to talk to shitty. Max about jobs. How am I being shitty? Just, please don't be shitty. How am I being shitty? Oh, uh, that takes us to the end of Pride 8. Now it's time that we pick the fight of the night. Machine, what was your pick for fight of the night? Clearly Paul Changin. Clearly for, you know, because I just, it's the first, like, real, like, knockout, knockout, you know, in the Pride. I mean, there's, there's been TKO's option. This, one, this guy was just fucking demolished. Yes. So, Paul Changin. Good vibe, fight of the night. It's a tie. I will say this because Volchanskin definitely up there. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's it, that fucking punch was just scary. I'm like, did I just watch someone die? Yes. Plain and simple. It's like I I, I never thought I would on TV, but did I just do that? So yes, great fight. However, I will say this: I always love Sakuraba in a fight. You know, he like he's yeah he's always a person. He's, you know, he's 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 always he's always improving. Like I said, fighting someone smaller than you when you're not used to that's you know, different style, and he fucking pulled it off. And he, against the Gracie, and he fucking pulled it off. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll say this. This was actually a, a really good card, although 
half of the fights went to decision. There wasn't a real boring fight. I mean, no. except with the uh, Coleman Morais fight. Well, even the Gary <clears throat> fight was boring. It's understandable when you're right. fighting a fucking barbarian like that. Right. Right. Yeah. No, I mean, oh yeah, fucking Morais and a six eight fuck ton of man. <laughs> but I mean, all they, they didn't. It didn't drag out. It all went pretty quick. These new round structures of the two ten minutes are actually working pretty well. They are. They'll get better because they'll eventually go to a, a first round is ten minutes. Followed by a five minute, uh, then another five minute uh, round structure. Yeah. You know, so I actually liked a lot of the fights on this card. I liked uh, Twinkle Toes, Frank Trigg. <laughs> I liked his uh, performance. I liked that fight. That was a good fight. I liked the Igor Volchanskin fight. Uh, and my p- fight of the night, though, I have to go with good vibe. It was Sakuraba. It was an exciting fight. The crowd was fucking into it like oh, crazy. Sa- Sakuraba's the man of Japan. <laughs> Fucking get the kid out the fuck out of that corner. Finally, <laughs> finally Sakuraba is the big name in Pride and in Japan. And so it should be. Like, well I mean, I mean it, it went it went so Shoji first, but then he became a fat fuck. Yes, yeah. And yeah. now it's Sakuraba. And I mean, fucking bright ass shorts, man. Yep. Yeah. And that will do it for episode eight. Wow, what a show. The best yet. Our next episode will be the opening rounds of the 2000 Grand Prix. So, what's in store for us? We'll have nine exciting fights to watch, starting with Nobuhiko Takada versus Hoist Gracie. Should be... Get the fuck out of here, man. Get the fuck out of my fight. I'm <laughs> skipping that fight. Fuck him. Should be, it should be an interesting one. Then we have Sakuraba versus Mezger. Igor Volchanskin versus Alexander Otska. Gary Goodridge versus Osam... I want to say this guy, his name looks like Osama, doesn't it? It's <laughs> Osamu at the Where bottom the fuck? there. At uh, the bottom. Um, Osamu. Marco, uh, no, oh, Osamu. Yeah. Yeah, but it does, do, it does look like Osama. I will give him that. Uh, Mark Coleman versus Masaki Satake. Akira Soji versus Ebenezer Francis Braga, who's returning. Mark Kerr versus Ensign Inoue. And then finally, two completely unknowns in Pride. Pro wrestling Kazuyuki Fujita making his MMA debut versus Hans Niemann, Dutch kickboxer and rings veteran. We'll also get an added alternate bout in case one of the competitors that win gets injured. And that is Vanderlei Silva versus Dirty Bob Schreiber. Oh. We're gonna we're gonna have a blast with that one, and finally the end of the first era of Pride. Now shit gets real. Promise you, shit gets fucking awesome from here on out. It's just gonna be one fucking topping event after another. And well, let's hope so. Because <clears throat> last time you told me shit gets better, I had to stand through another fucking fifty minute fucking battle, of jackass. We're going to surely have a blast with that one. But for now, dear viewers, we must bid you adieu. So, for the machine, you. the Columbia good vibe, Woo! I am the most dangerous man alive, wishing you goodbye, good luck, and... You fucking jerks later. <laughs>